Uh, good morning, good evening, dear colleagues. We welcome everyone to the round table on international models of scientific development and research management. Today, we invite uh, the distinguished uh, expert from around the world, and we would like to uh, express our appreciation to uh, our colleagues from uh, different countries for their uh, participation. Uh, so we have uh, representatives of 11 countries and today we are going to discuss American model of science policy. We will talk about uh, research man management in Hong Kong, Canada, Turkey, Lithuania. As well, we will talk about Finnish model of uh, uh, innovations uh, and uh, also about um, science policy in Sweden and uh, South Korea, United Kingdom and uh, in other countries. That's why uh, we think that our uh, discussion will be very productive and useful. And my colleagues, uh, Halida Zhigulov and I, Baudran Bukayev, will moderate today's session. And our session uh, takes place online on Facebook page so that everyone can uh, leave their questions and comments. Good evening, everyone. We are honored to welcome all of you to our expert discussion on the best global practices in science governance and research management. Today's event is organized within the framework of the Kazakhstani governmental program, Yel Umete, the change management trading program for industry managers for institutional reforms and the nation's 100 step plan. Baujan and myself, we are participants of this program, and as part of it, we prepare recommendations to our Prime Minister and other ministers on the reform of science and research management in Kazakhstan. At the beginning of August, we already had an expert discussion with Kazakh national scientists and researchers to hear their views and collect recommendations. And today, the main purpose of our event is to listen to our distinguished fellow researchers from 11 countries and learn about the global practices in science governance and research management. These global practices will be also analyzed by us in preparation of recommendations for our, for our government. Many thanks to all our guest speakers and the audience for joining us today. And now I would like to present to you the head of Yelbasa Academy, the administrator of the Yel Umete program, uh, Mr. Fatkat Shlemuratovich. Um, Kwanganov, please. Uh, Mr. Kwanganov, the floor is yours. Thank you, Khalida. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome all the participants of today's discussion on behalf of uh, the Yelbasa Academy. I would like to express my appreciation to distinguished speakers uh, for participation and for the opportunity to discuss a very important topic, a new model of science development in Kazakhstan. Our meeting was organized by a team of young, ambitious uh, scientists working within program of change leaders uh, training. This program has been launched uh, by the North Sultan Nazarbayev Foundation and implemented together with the government as a part of, of a large initiative Yelumete, to support young, talented professionals. The government has defined a number of uh, specific problems in several sectors that are critical uh, for the modernization of our country. Uh, the context of pandemic, it is extremely important uh, of the crisis overcoming for accelerated social economic development. Most of the problem did not find their solution for a long uh, time at all. 45 sectoral tasks have been fixed for 11 sectors. To solve them within the program, 230 professionals uh, with the experience in Kazakhstan uh, and abroad uh, were selected and united to 35 teams. Each team has to find its own way of, of solving uh, the assigned task and defend the project before the government for further implementation. Frankly speaking, it looks like uh, 300 Spartans in the battle of Thermopylae. Uh, the science development uh, team sets a very ambitious 
go uh, the transition uh, to a new model of science development. The discussion about uh, the development uh, of science in Kazakhstan has been going on for uh, many years. The first president of, of Kazakhstan, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, has repeatedly set the task before the government to increase the science financing up to 5% of G uh, GDP. Important changes uh, have taken place in the management of science. Uh, Supreme uh, Scientific and Technical Commission established several years ago, as well as uh, National Scientific Councils uh, with the participation of scientists themselves in order to rise the role in decision-making process. So uh, the commercialization of science uh, is growing, but the situation has not changed so much. Uh, today, the share of R&D in GDP is 0.12%. This is the lowest point of Kazakhstani science uh, in the history. It remains unclaimed by real sector and funded by government mainly. Uh, Kazakhstani scientists themselves see only reason, insufficient investment from the state and do not consider the reasons of the low demand uh, from, uh, for science from the real sector. All initiatives from scientists are related only uh, with improving the existing model of science. The situation is familiar to many countries uh, that had experience of transition to a modern model of science development. A team of young scientists offers a new extraordinary approach, systemic solution based on uh, the best world practice. In fact, there are only two models of science in the world. The Soviet model with centralized uh, funding and the American open model with economic nudging of demand for science. An open uh, model of science uh, was proposed in uh, 1945 by, uh, by uh, Vannevar Bush, the science advisor uh, to the President of the United States in uh, his report, Science the uh, Endless Frontier. We can see the main features of uh, this model in all the countries with successful science, namely uh, tax incentives for the real sector, the support of university science and uh, national grant funding foundations. Why it cannot work in Kazakhstan? It requires uh, an analysis detailed. In this context, the experience of the countries represented uh, by the speakers today is very important for successful transformation of uh, science in Kazakhstan. In conclusion, uh, I would like to wish a productive discussion for all the participants and success in achieving their ambitious uh, goals for the team of young scientists. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Thank Kwan. you. Thank you very much for Hacham Ganganov. So, uh, indeed, science policy is uh, one of the sensitive part of the state policy, and each country needs to be more attentive to um, this uh, sphere. And uh, as you told in your uh, presentation that we have uh, two models, it's Soviet Union models and American models. That's why first part of our discussion, we would like focus on American experience of uh, uh, science policy and technology. And uh, let me introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor of uh, Public Administration and International Affairs and Political Science of Maxwell School of Syracuse University, author of many articles on science policy and space policy, fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration, Henry Lambright. Please, Professor Lambright, floor is yours. Thank you very much. And just raise your hand if I go beyond my 10 minutes. There really are three models uh, of science policy in America. The first model I would call the formative model, which was 1945 to 50. 
and that's the one that was mentioned involving Bush. A second model came from 1950 to 1989, and that was really what I call the Cold War model. And then since 1989, we've been in what I call the globalization model. The first model, formation, form formative model, came out of World War II. And what Bush proposed was the equivalent of a Ministry of Science, a significant large agency that would direct science policy in the United States. Uh, that, that model had one significant defect from the standpoint of President Truman, and that was that he wanted to insulate the model, insulate science policy from politics. The uh, National Science Board, part-time people, would appoint the director who would not, that means it wouldn't be directed by the president. So, Bush, so the Truman uh, opposed the original Bush model and uh, it took five years to get what we have today in terms of a, uh, uh, a central science agency, except, except that agency, the National Science Foundation, by the time it came into existence in 1950, was a pretty small player. And the dominant model that, that emerged was what was a pluralistic model. Uh, you could call it open. Uh, it certainly was pluralistic and it was based around mission, what are called mission agencies. Uh, these are agencies that have missions other than the support of science directly, like the Defense Department or, the, or energy or transportation or what have you. The model that came, existed from 1950 to 1989, I call the Cold War model, because this pluralistic model of mission agencies, uh, which was directed by the president, uh, tended uh, to be skewed very directly in terms of the Cold War and the competition with the Soviet Union. Uh, it was very uh, competitive. Government was very dominant. Uh, industry's role was mainly as contractors and uh, competition was the key, but it was competition in a very narrow way around uh, national security issues. If you're looking for a particular project or a particular agency that sort of symbolizes the Cold War era of science policy, it would be NASA and it would be the space race and Project Apollo. You can remember Project Apollo was dominated by NASA, dominated by the government, and essentially uh, was a crash program. And that, was, and that was like a lot of other programs in the Cold War era. In 1989, of course, the Berlin Wall fell, and the major rationale for science and technology policy that was existing, Cold War, uh, disappeared. And the America began searching for another approach, another model. And the new model, what it has, which has been evolving and which exists today, has, I think, uh, a number of features that are extremely uh, important. One, government is still important, but not as dominant as it was before. Uh, two, industry is probably spent, is spending more money uh, than the government is on research and development. And that behooves government to work more closely with industry, not as a contractor, but industry as an independent uh, being who, uh, to produce uh, products that government is interested in. Uh, four, the uh, universities have always been involved. And, the, uh, and uh, to some extent, the ch there has been that little less change on the university front over the years, uh, a, a tribute, I think, to Vannevar Bush's original model, which was to bring the universities into the system in a creative way. The big difference is that during the Cold War, there was a tremendous push by government to produce more scientists and engineers. And since then, uh, that push from the government for more scientists and engineers has been more specialized oriented mainly into STEM fields and particularly trying to get people, people who are underutilized like, like women scientists. The key, uh, if, if competition was probably the key uh, uh, word for the Cold War period, I'd say cooperation is the emerging word. 
in the globalization world. America, like a lot of countries, doesn't have as much money as it used to for science and technology. And that's because it is spends, it spends so much money on uh, what, we, what we call entitlement programs, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, so, uh, social programs. What's left in the budget is what is called discretionary. So science and technology comes out of that 20% or so of discretionary money. The uh, consequence of that is to do big projects, to do big science and technology, you almost have to cooperate. So if you're looking for a model there, a specific project or specific symbolic project, look at the space station, the International Space Station. The International Space Station is, is led by the U.S., but it involves 16 nations, including our former adversary, the Soviet Union, uh, which is now Russia, of course. And But notice also that when the shuttle went, uh, the way we are getting astronauts up and down to the space station is now in private sector hands, uh, SpaceX in particular. So the space station, I think, represents kind of the new model, which focuses on cooperation in which we need help because of the fact, one, we need money like everybody. And two, there's a lot of brain power all over the world that if it can be enlisted, can allow you to do new projects. So the American system is a, is a, is, has evolved it's 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 led it's definitely led by the political world and you can see this in terms of the priorities that come as we have new presidents i think the big issues for the future relate to cooperation around problems like uh, climate change and whether the united states can somehow find a way to to work with china and countries where there is a clearly a uh, a lot of people, domestically at least, who would much rather co compete. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Lambright. And now uh, we would like to give the floor to uh, Professor Fred Isaacs. Uh, Fred Isaacs is uh, the Dean of the School of Law at KIMEP, at Kimep uh, local university in Almaty, Kazakhstan. Prior to joining KIMEP in 2019, uh, he served as a law professor in the School of Business and in various administrative positions at Merrill Hurst University in the United States. And Fred is a member of numerous state and federal bars, including the bar of the Supreme Court of the United States. He has been a senior law clerk for four federal judges and for more than a decade had his own federal appellate consultant practice. Uh, dear Fred, thank you very much for being with us today. And may we invite you uh, to share your views, your addition, the additional information about research management and science governance in the US. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can everyone hear me OK I, as I go? I'll assume so. Uh, I'm approaching this topic from a lawyer's perspective. And uh, so I, I guess what I'll do is go ahead and begin with both the two key components, regulation and funding. When we talk about regulation uh, of scientific research and funding in the United States, it is primarily a matter of federal law. In fact, Professor Lambright uh, already made that pretty clear. It's not that states are not involved, but they're primarily involved in the realm of teaching. And I'll touch on that in a minute. The federal government, to the extent it provides uh, regulatory oversight, and I would point out um, as kind of a general proposition that most research, uh, scientific and otherwise, that is conducted in the United States does not involve much, if any, federal government oversight. Uh, the federal government is primarily interested in those areas where it's funding the research or where the research touches on an area that is already governed directly or indirectly by federal law. Uh, the big agencies that would be uh, primarily involved in this, if we're going to use alphabet soup things, would be the FDA, the DHHS, uh, NIH, NRC. They're primarily concerned with research involving biomedical, human research, animal research, drugs, uh, to a lesser extent nuclear energy, which is not as big as, uh, as it used to be, but it's still, of course, heavily regulated. 
Where the states get involved is primarily in the realm of teaching. And again, Professor Lambright touched on this with NASA, uh, the Cold War model, which really was a reaction to uh, the Soviet Union's launch of Sputnik in 1957. Because in 1958, the federal government passed the NDEA. I believe that stands for National Defense Education Act. And the idea was that whereas education had primarily been a local and state matter in the United States, the federal government saw that there was a need for much more funding of scientific work. And that meant uh, teachers in science, uh, science programs, the development of science labs. And this provided federal funding for this in schools from kindergarten through high school and on into universities and graduate schools. Uh, today, to the extent we think of this, and again, Professor Lambright beat me to this, we think of STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. In terms of funding, um, this is an area where, and I, I think it is a reflection of the fact that the bulk of the federal government's annual budget is really non-discretionary and only a small portion is discretionary. But when we look at funding uh, for scientific research in the United States, we have to look beyond the, the federal government to three things. And maybe this is a reflection of my uh, coming from Indianapolis and growing up near the uh, Indianapolis Speedway, but I think of the initials STP, and that would be source, type, and purpose. What is the source of the funding? Uh, there are only two sources. It's either got to be public money, which means government funding, or it has to be private. And that means it's coming from for-profit businesses, not-for-profit foundations. And there are a great many of those. We think of Ford, MacArthur, Rockefeller, and of course, Bill and Melinda Gates, many billions of dollars available in those, uh, even individuals. In terms of the type of funding, it has to be either direct or indirect. Direct means it's coming directly from the donor to the recipient to do the, the research. Indirect, once again, Professor Lambright already touched on this, it is largely tax incentives, whether we're talking credits or deductions. And for those who are not familiar with the complexities of the federal government's internal revenue code, I will not even try to explain the difference between credits and deductions, but they're both valuable to businesses that are funding research, although the credits are more so. The purpose, once again, two things we're only looking at. The purpose is either applied research or academic research. Applied, as its name indicates, could still be done at academic institutions, and much of it is, but it means you're looking for a pretty much immediate practical result. We, we think of the rush to develop a vaccine for the COVID-19 virus. Uh, academic research is either literally that, it's conducted at academic institutions, or figuratively, in the sense that we don't see an immediate uh, practical application, but it interests the scientists, so it's academic. And, and I don't mean that to sound facetious, much of the most valuable research that's been conducted began as academic and turned out to have very practical applications and vice versa. And I'll try and give an example later. When we're talking about government oversight of research, uh, to reiterate a key point, the government isn't that interested in regulating research except when it's funding it or when the subject of the research touches on a matter that's already governed by federal law. Uh, even then, it's surprising how much of the government's oversight is really more indirect. Many agencies do not dispatch people to monitor this stuff closely. Instead, they require the recipient of these funds to provide what are called IRBs, Institutional Review Boards, and those in-house entities are charged with administering uh, the regulations that are governing the dispersal and, and, and uh, the funding of the research being done. They file periodic reports with the agency. The agency from time to time conducts audits. One of the things I was asked about is whether there are strategic or program documents governing a lot of this research in the US. And wow, once again, Professor Lambright beat me to this. Uh, 
with the Cold War being gone, we don't see nearly as much of that um, as we used to. It's much more coming from the private sector. To the extent we do see strategic or program type documents, they tend to be more narrowly targeted. And they're often the result of some political reaction to some immediate perception of, of, a, of a concern, a weapons design, computer technology. And so restrictions may be placed on who can conduct the research or with whom it can be shared and that sort of thing. As far as funding goes, particularly where the government is involved, the government provides a little over half of academic research uh, funding in the United States today. Nearly half of that is provided from the private sector. In terms of the government, probably the single biggest player is the National Institute of Health, NIH, which I believe this year has a budget in excess of $42 billion. So that's a substantial amount. Even so, as I point out, nearly half of all of the money that goes for academic research is done by the pri provided by the private sector. When it comes to um, applied research, uh, the overwhelming majority of that funding does come from the private sector, as you might guess. It doesn't mean the government isn't involved. Uh, it does provide some. And we see that particularly where the government is interested in an immediate benefit to something, once again, a, a vaccine, uh, and it might provide grants. More often, it provides incentives in the sense of tax credits or deductions, but sometimes also simply removing what are perceived to be regulatory obstacles to speed up things. And we do tend to see this where drugs are concerned. If I were to offer an example or two one would be uh, one from history. In the early 1960s, you have a couple of young scientists working at IBM, International Business Machines, and they're charged with the early development of some aspects of microwave technology. And one of the things that they noticed was uh, no matter which direction of the universe, in, in the, the day or night sky, they pointed their radio telescopes, those big parabolic reflectors, there was some background noise. And no matter what they did, they couldn't eliminate it. And so they continued with their research, largely funded by IBM. And over time, uh, they wound up proving uh, a mathematical and scientific basis for a brilliant theory propounded by a French uh, theologian and astrophysicist from nearly 50 years earlier. I believe his name was Demetra, a friend of Einstein. And we call that today the Big Bang Theory. But the bulk of that funding came from the private sector, but it started with purely applied research spilling over into academic research, and they didn't do too badly getting uh, the Nobel Prizes. Another example I can think of would be from my own experience involving litigation. Uh, we're all aware of the Fukushima disaster involving the Daiichi nuclear plant and the fallout, and, and, and no pun is intended from that, which led to litigation. Uh, this litigation, which has been going on for nearly a decade, is still ongoing in the United States. Uh, the case with which I was involved for a time is now wending its way to the Supreme Court. We're talking upwards of 70,000 plaintiffs in these uh, multi-party class action lawsuits. Um, and a substantial amount of scientific research had to be done along with legal research. And this all was funded from the private sector. Um, we don't know what the outcome will be with the Supreme Court, although I can speculate uh, what it will do. But the litigation involving, you know, the Tokyo Electric Power Company, General Electric, um, and the interplay of state and federal governments, uh, the treaties the United States has with Japan, etc. So these are just just a couple of examples. Uh, so I guess if I had to give a wrap up, my wrap up would be sort of a long-standing belief in the United States. The best thing the government can do very often where research is involved is sort of clear the path as best it can and then simply get out of the way and let the private sector do uh, what it tends to do best. That doesn't mean there shouldn't be regulation or oversight, but no more than is absolutely necessary. And with that, I thank you. And that concludes my presentation. Okay, thank you.
thank thank you very uh, much uh, uh, for uh, presentation uh, their colleagues uh, i think uh, sharing your very interesting uh, experience of science uh, formulation and creation science schools in the united states i think it's very useful and you already talk about um, uh, uh, about uh, uh, private sector how private sector uh, invests to uh, science uh, and as we can see uh, really several decades the american private sector su successfully invested in science even in this case the government plays uh, as in indirect role uh, in this ar arrangement by means uh, of tax policies the labor laws uh, trade and another uh, policy uh, could you please elaborate on these tools and uh, policies just like bullet point because it will be as a recommendation for other countries to implement uh, like this successful uh, uh, experience are you directing the question to me or to professor uh, lambright, lambright and to, to you so okay uh, if you want me if you would like me to lead off you're talking what how has government worked with industry yeah, yeah, yeah. To advance certain technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, government, I think, has uh, been successful in bringing certain technologies to what might be called a proof of concept stage. Uh, if you look at the computer industry, it actually begins with uh, the government and mainly the Defense Department at an agency called DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency in which uh, it uh, invested in this new technology, uh, bringing it to a certain stage where the private sector saw profit and then the profits that the, the private sector moved in. So I think, and that is, and that is uh, duplicated today, uh, mainly as in this third period that I mentioned, this globalization period, uh, the Clinton administration looked at certain what they called strategic technologies and identified them. And among these were biotechnology, information technology, and, and nanotechnology. And essentially, the government, through a number of agencies, not, a, not creating a new agency, but asking various agencies to work together to advance these technologies that were considered emerging to a point where the industry would take over. And obviously, as Fred said, once it, you prove the concept, then you might go to other kinds of mechanisms like tax breaks, light regulation, half a dozen others. Uh, but government has, has played a significant role in what is called emerging or strategic technologies. And I think that's a very important lesson for Kazakhstan uh, and the government, because the government is, a, industry usually is reluctant to invest a great deal in money and okay. unless it really thinks there's something there at the end of the of the, of the rainbow so this is essential this is very important and you and it seems to me it's a it's what you're going to see a lot of if, if bush gets elected uh, because he wants to we want essentially to advance energy technologies very very significantly great thank you fred can you add something um, Professor Lamright, absolutely correct. The government's uh, involvement, it's, it is amazing how it can provide incentives for things. Coming from the Pacific Northwest, one of the areas where I saw this was in waste management, um, ecological concerns. People talk a good game about wanting to recycle. Uh, there was even a very funny but fairly dark movie dealing with a woman who actually murdered another woman because she wouldn't recycle. Uh, as silly as that sounds, recycling is critically important. And we've done it in our past during wartime, for example, use it up, wear it out, make it do uh, motto during World War II. And so the government would get involved in saying we can encourage people to recycle if we can make it financially viable for them. Businesses are not going to want to invest uh, even with tax incentives, at best, they can only break even. They need to be able to make a profit. So how do we do that? 
government would subsidize things to help with the research so that ways could be found to separate out the trash, metal from plastic, plastic from biodegradable materials, and then ways of moving those efficiently so things that would biodegrade could be put in landfills and other things could then be recycled. And some of this recycling is more efficiently done overseas. And so the United States ships an ungodly amount of its trash to other countries that have more efficient means of doing so. But just that alone, tax incentives, uh, creating miniature free trade zones, um, providing incentives for employers to hire certain people to handle these this kinds of work and giving them tax incentives and subsidies for their payroll have all helped uh, that industry. Whether it will ever ultimately be profitable, I don't know, but it's certainly moving, at least in the Pacific Northwest, much faster than it would have been without those government incentives. Well, oh, great. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. So another question, and uh, the historical overview shows that uh, the main drivers uh, to uh, science development in the United States, it was competition between Soviet Union and uh, United States. So what is the mission of science today? Hmm. That's a good question. It's, it, it's uh, since uh, the end of the Cold War, I would say that there has been a, a great deal of uh, uncertainty, lack of coherence in the United States about science policy. The Soviet Union gave us an enemy uh, and a focus. And without that, the United States history, remember, built around mission, mission agencies, not NSF, mission agencies, has been what is our big mission? And as Fred said, the closest we've come to a, a big mission other than defense is health. And so America is very good at uh, killing people and saving them. Uh, and make, uh, really seems to be our priorities. The, the real problem America has in science policy is that uh, there is a, it's almost like you can, as you, You'll hear this in the camp political campaign about the word socialism. Trump's already picking Biden as a socialist. The issue is really how much government into the private sector. You can't use the word socialism. Okay, what can you use? Industrial policy? Uh-uh, that's a bad word too. So we don't have the word for it. And the consequence is that if there is a recognition that this is a gap in our system. All the tools that we use, and Fred mentioned none of them, are very uh, are done in a very piecemeal way. There's no real great strategy behind this. There is a recognition that in the world, uh, other countries are coming up, namely China, which has a very different system when it comes to industrial policy. Uh, so I'd say what I'm what I'm trying to say is that America does have a since the end of the Cold War. America has moved along. There is an absence of coherence. Uh, emphasis has been health uh, and uh, everything else. But with respect to industrial policy, it is, uh, it is a highly politicized area. And the consequence is that you have, uh, you have essentially a, a difficult time coming up with a model that will be what we would call economic development. We do do it. We do do it, but we do it in a very piecemeal way without a lot of strategy. And that is a weakness in the American system, in my opinion. I don't know what Fred thinks about that, but I see that as a weakness. Thank you. Fred? No, actually, I would agree. Um, I think in that sense, Americans are still very, very English. Um, in that sense, we're not great planners. We tend to react. We may react quickly and sometimes very well, but we're more reactive personalities than proactive to the extent we are developing any policies. I agree. We've shifted pretty much everything to healthcare and look at the political battles that we've seen um, with that just in what was uh, 
formerly known, well, still often called by its detractors as Obamacare, and then the attacks on that literally in the very first days in office with some executive orders that came down from President Trump. But that is the closest we have to anything representing a national policy. And if it's a policy, it is a mess. It's a mess. So, yes. yes. It's a real mess. And mm -hmm. it's extremely, as you can see, but looking at the COVID crisis, it's exceedingly limited. Uh, we, uh, we, we clearly, if we come up with a vaccine, the issue of delivering it puts <laughs> you into a whole realm of policy where America is, is I think, uh, behind a lot of other countries. Mm -hmm. the, the delivery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And my last question, because uh, just in conclude of your uh, presentation, as I understood that uh, the main actors of um, uh, science policy development in United States are government, scientists, and private sector. So uh, the question is like easy. Could, can the um, science develop without uh, private sector? Is it possible? Well, I don't know. It's uh, I'd say I'd say that the Soviet Union model is your other model that you're talking about today. There was a clearly a, a mainly there was not my I'd say there's your other model, and the answer is that uh, if if you think that the Soviet Union if the Soviet Union model was successful, there would still be a Soviet Union today. So that, <laughs> that model did not work. Yeah. I think that the American system, the pluralist system, where government plays a role and industry plays a role, and they work in tandem one way or another as contractors during the Cold War and as independent entities today, I think that model seems to work better. I'm not saying that the, it is perfect. I would give it. I don't. I would give it a B minus uh, mm -hmm. in its operations. But the other model, the Soviet model, where government dominates and without very much uh, competition or rivalry uh, or other ideas, I think that model has gets an F. Uh, so you're de you're not dealing with A. So if Kazakhstan wants to move ahead. You've got to come up with some hybrid. Uh, which involves uh, some uh, that looks at the defects as well as the assets of the United States. That, okay. That's what I'm trying. And I think industry is part of the asset, but it is a keep in mind what Fred said. It's a profit motive. It's a it's a profit motivated sector. So mm -hmm. it will not do things. It will not do things that need to be done for society. Okay. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Did you want me to? <laughs> yeah, if you want to add something. The only th he's, he's covered it so well. The only thing I would add is the closest you could come in the United States to any kind of a hybrid. You think of things like public broadcasting, uh, things that are quasi governmental, but still largely private. They're allowed to make a profit, but they have to administer the funds in a certain way but they are able to provide services that um, with some governmental oversight, but they're able to provide services with a mix of funding from both the government and the private sector. Uh, they, they can do so with things that maybe the government wouldn't do as well by itself and the private sector might not because they wouldn't see the profit motive. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just picking public broadcasting as one example, mainly because I enjoy it, but there are, I'm sure, many hybrid models out there. Uh, the key is you, you don't want to take the government out of the picture, but uh, you do want to minimize some of its oversight. Ideally, if you could figure out where it's not needed, then definitely get out of the way. But uh, somebody has to be there to ensure that people are abiding by the rules. Um, otherwise, you don't really have truly fair competition. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, we finish our uh, discussion on American model of uh, science development. Thank you very much to our speakers.
So, and we are continuing, and now we will present uh, Asian models of uh, science development. Thank you very much, colleagues. Bye bye. Hello, everyone. Welcome, everyone who is just joining to our event. Today, we are holding an expert discussion on international models on science governance and research management. And now uh, I am pleased to invite the speakers of our next panel session. The next session will be dedicated to the international models of science governance in Southeast Asia. And we have four distinguished speakers from Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong, and the Republic of Korea. And now I'm delighted to invite Professor Masako Iwano. She is a Dean of the Postgraduate School of Intercultural Studies at Yamaguchi Prefectural University in Japan. Uh, Professor Masako is a member of the Evaluation Committee of the Japan University of Education Association, member of the Committee for the Center for Education Reform and Evaluation of the Japan University uh, of the Japan Association for Public University, a former chairperson of the Japan Society for Intercultural Studies and team leader of the Go Global Japan Project for the promotion of global human resources, which was financially uh, funded, uh, which was funded by the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology of Japan. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Masako Iwana. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much for inviting this to speak in this session. I'd like to share my slides. Just wait a minute, please. Can you see my slide? Okay. Okay. So I'll talk about the mission of science in the 21st century especially the area which Japanese government in, is investing in order to establish the future society with AI, artificial intelligence, in that all people from young to old will have an AI literacy targeting 2040. I will talk from my current positions on university acc accreditation and also on uh, as an advisor for leadership program for higher education. So this is my university. I teach both undergraduate and postgraduate schools. There are three questions I was given to talk in this session. The first question is how the research area is managed at the level of the state. The answer is that it is managed mainly by the Japan Association for Promotion of Science. The second question is about the strategic programs and the documents on research and science development. Japanese government policies are guided and delivered through research funding. The third question is about funding. There are different levels and many kinds of research grants available each year to increase the quality of research base at the national level and also to progress the top level. So first I will introduce funding. This is a website for the Japan Association for Promotion of Science which introduce new policies on research. Research grant applications are made through this website and the outcomes of research are shared on this website. Also, there is a website network for researchers throughout Japan called the Research Map. This graph shows a basic research funding level. There are about six 160,000 researchers in Japan. Every year, approximately one person out of four can get some funding from small projects such as 10,000 US dollars to 3 million US dollars. This graph shows the number of researchers. The top is China. The second is USA, and the third is Japan. This graph shows the size of research budget. 
Japan spends the third largest budget. However, it is said that Japan should be spending at least twice as much, 74 billion US dollars, in terms of the large size of its population and economy. This shows the research funding against the GDP. Korean government provides the largest funding and China next. Germany comes third. The fourth are USA, France, and Japan. From the size of GDP, it can be said that Japan should be spending more for education and research. Next, I will introduce the Japanese government's vision for 2040. The 21st century is named as Society 5.0 was super smart society. These are some features of the Society 5.0. Today, I will focus on AI-ready society in which all citizens from young to old are ready to be benefited by AI and IoT. Key words are digital and global. Such society can be achieved by the progress of research and education. New trends in education focus on STEAM and global. A new policy states that from primary school to university, all children and students need to study data science and AI literacy. Another change is that Japan is receiving the fourth largest migrant workers and so, ability to work in multicultural team is getting important, not only in large companies, but also in local and small companies. This is a target numbers to educate young people for data science and AI literacy. At the base, all children and students need to have basic understanding Experts are at university graduate level, of which 5% should be global experts level. Global top level are 100 people every year. Also, working adults are encouraged to join continuing education to acquire new knowledge and skills on digital transformation. This is an example of some AI software called Cubana. Since individual children's learning speed is different depending on subject, AI assists each child by choosing and providing the most suitable learning program. This is an example of educating globally talented young people at university level. Due to the restriction of study abroad caused by the COVID-19, virtual exchange programs and teaching one class jointly between different countries such as COIL is getting popular. Details of policies can be found in a grand design for higher education 2040. At the higher education level, Japanese government is encouraging universities to get into the top 1000 in the world university ranking. At the moment, Japan has the second largest number of universities within this ranking. To get into the very top may be very difficult. However, if the quantity is increased, more students throughout Japan will be able to have access to high quality of education. To finish my talk, I'd like to mention about the purpose of education and research. 
The purpose of education is ultimately to create a better society and the world where each human being can live in happiness. SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, targeting for 2030, may be one of the indicators. This is SDG's achievement ranking, and Japan is on the 15th place. These show areas that Japan made a high and low achievement. There are many social problems within Japan, as well as in the world. It is argued, argued that we need to com come up with creative and innovative approach for problem solving, shifting from older approaches. Vision, technology, and design are to be educated for young people. In the last century, education was for the nation states and for the state building. But in the 21st century, education should be for individual human beings. Thank you very much for your kind listening. Anna, for your great presentation. And um, one of the notable successful experience in science development is uh, Singapore, your neighbors. So that's why let me give a um, next speech to our guest from Singapore, chairman of the Economic Development Innovation, Singapore Private Limited, who spent more than 40 years in public service where he played an instrumental role in Singapore's economic transformation into a knowledge-based economy, Mr. Philip Yao. Please, Mr. Yao, please. Yeah. I have given uh, my presentation to uh, Kalina. Can she bring it up? Uh, Kalina, are you there? Okay, can you bring up the presentation? Can you bring up my presentation? Hello. Uh, okay. Okay, good. So I will you through this presentation was, was given in Tokyo in uh, early 2019 when the uh, World Bank invited me and the Japanese government asked me uh, what is the focus on innovation so I go quickly slide number one is basically economic uh, where we are trying to focus on innovation so slide number two slide number two please can you go to slide number two uh, okay, now basically we are a young country. We are 55 years old this year. So we have gone through five stages of economic development. You can see from the slides from labor intensive to skill intensive to what we call in the year 2000, uh, focusing on knowledge. Slide number three. So I took the 2018 data and I presented it here. You can see it for yourself. Slide number four. So where we are today is basically what I call the knowledge uh, base or focus economy. That's what we're working on. Slide number five. So the key in research and development is research and development must have end purpose. The end purpose is research, innovation, and economic growth. So I use this. The key in research and innovation is really people. So I use these three uh, advertisements which I run to attract young people to do PhDs, to do startups, to do higher education. Next, slide number six. So what we did was in 2001, I launched a program to train 1,000 PhDs over 10 years, 100 bright students from the high schools. The top high school, 1%, will be sent overseas to do a bachelor's and PhD. This is an example of the young students. They are focused on two areas, engineering and biomedical sciences. Slide number six. Now, given our size of population, we have only about three and a half million Singaporeans. So we came up with a program to attract young people from our neighboring countries at age of 15. They come to Singapore, we provide free high school education. 
from the best of these students, we select them and also send them overseas for their bachelor's and PhD, and we give them a Singapore passport. Slide number seven. Next slide. So this example, the first is an Indian girl. She came to Singapore age of 15. The second is a Vietnamese girl came age of 15. So the high school education is subsidized by us, free, dormitories, everything. And these are the bachelor's students. Then they are picked for overseas education, bachelor's and PhDs. Both of them are doing biomedical sciences and they have become Singapore citizens. So in a sense, we bring in talent into Singapore to supplement our small population. Slide number eight, next page. Oh, so over the last uh, three, 2001, we have built up the human capital for R&D quite fast. Slide number nine, 10. Go ahead. Okay. The commitment is funding. For this year, 2020, the funding is uh, $15 billion US as well over five years. That means every year is $3 billion. Next slide, please. So the key is not just funding, but how many licenses in terms of technology license, revenue, spin-offs, and also patent filing. These are the criteria. Next slide, please. So the key is to train 1,005. My original target was 1,000 over five years, over 10 years, 100 PhDs a year. We have now exceeded. Now, these are funded by us. This doesn't include the students to do PhD on their own, or they are funded by the universities. So we have trained 1,500 PhDs, and all of them are Singaporeans. They come from different race, Indian, Chinese, uh, Vietnamese, what have you. Next slide, please. You can see that notice there's a high percentage of ladies. In fact, the biomedical sciences, basically health and medicine, 60% are ladies. In engineering, 60% are boys. So it's a good distribution. Next. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, to make sure that these young people, when they come back home from the overseas studies, there must be a receptacle of places for them. So what we have done is to build infrastructure to receive all these students coming home. And the key is one of the agency, a piece of land I selected in 2001, called One North, which is 200 hectare. So in this physical facility, there are two classes, the biomedical cluster, the second is the engineering uh, cluster. So these two facilities are all there. Next. So the, the biomedical sciences has got all the medical facilities. We have about uh, almost three and a half, uh, three and a half million square feet, a new square feet for biopolis, for physician police, which is IT, computer science, material science, uh, manufacturing, is about four million square feet. So combined together, we have about seven and a half million square feet of physical space to receive the young people when they come back home. Next. So this is the physical location. Uh, my office is there, one north. Uh, physically, it's a 200 hectare. Today, we have only developed half the land. We still have another 100 over hectare available for development. Next, please. So this example, the biomedical. Now, the key is that these facilities are quite unique in a the sense they are public research, but they also uh, house private. The companies can also co-locate their rent space. So in the same facility, the public, public sector rents space, the private sector rents space, the private sector brings their own funding, the public research get grants, and it rents space. So it's basically a cohabitation of public and private research. Next slide, please. This is a physical facility. Uh, my office is now at Fishing Police, it's for engineering sciences. The highest building, the first tall building is where my office and was designed by a Japanese architect. Next, please. So, the key, as I said, where every public research agency is housed, there's also private sector is housed there. So in a sense, the deliberate co-location of public and private research, obviously the private research, the government funds 50% of the grants of the expenditure. Next slide, please. Uh, this is for media, for the entertainment uh, area, the same, public and private uh, government broadcasters and private uh, entertainment software can use. Next, please. Now, the key is talent. So what we have done is now we have trained these young people. 
high percentage of ladies and medical sciences, they are home. Uh, they are guaranteed employment for five years. And after that, they are free uh, because they are obligated only for five years. Next slide, please. So you see now they have gone to different uh, startup. They encourage them to do their own business. Next. Now, after the funding, which is 19 billion Singapore, US 15 billion, the key is what economic value. So this is the paper that's available. I've uh, given a hard copy presentation. You can borrow it uh, from the internet, RIE 2020. This is chaired by the Prime Minister. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, now the key out goal is how to encourage young scientists to come out to start their own companies. So what we have is this a venture capital initiative of which the government provides seed funding. The companies also provide their own uh, co-funding. Next. And again, to help the startup, we don't build expensive places. We look for low cost facility, well equipped, that the companies can rent at a very low rate and then so we subsidize the rental. These are two examples of the location quite next to my office. Next slide, please. Now, the key is how many startups have encouraged. I would say that we have since today encouraged quite a number of them, and hopefully they will continue to grow. Next slide. And as a case studies, this is a medical devices example of companies that do. Again, we support the young people to go and join these companies. Next slide. Uh, these are a few other projects. Also, the medical sciences are focused here. Next slide. So we have built one near my office. Now we're building another in another location to house the environmental engineering uh, group of company next to the university. We have two key universities, National University of Singapore and Nyan Technology University. So the second location is focusing on environmental engineering. Next. So this is a physical location for the startups. There are eight blocks, they have 56,000 square meters or 560,000 square feet. The 800 startup, there are 53 companies supporting them. These are low cost uh, startup locations. Next. Here's an example. This is for biomedical sciences. The labs are fully equipped. So the young startup can just rent space and rent equipment. They don't have to buy equipment. So they rent a space, they use a lab, and they are given grants and private sector money to do the startups. Next. That's it. And the key is to encourage the young people, the students, to come into the locations. Hopefully, that you can inculcate them interest in science. Next. And this is another location we're building one to focus on manufacturing. Again, the facilities are fully equipped. And finally, that must be the last presentation. Thank you. Yep, these are some examples of the start. This we are free to circulate to the members if they are interested. That's it. These the details. Thank you. I think I finished it. Uh, welcome. Any questions for anybody? Dear Mr. Yeo, thank you very much for your insightful presentation, very informative. We are very happy to host you today with us. And now I would like to give the floor to Associate Professor Dr. Horace Young. He is an Associate Professor in Commercial Law at the University of Leicester in the UK. Previously, he also taught at Exeter, Oxford and Universitat Osnabrück. Born and raised in Hong Kong, though now living and working in the UK, uh, his research has focused on his home city and country. Recently, uh, Dr. Yong also started to shift some of his attention to the Central Asian region. In relation to Kazakhstan, he published research about the Astana International Financial Center in Washington University Global Studies Law Review. Also, he has been recently awarded seed funding from the Economic and Social Research Council of UK Impact Acceleration Account to further expand his activities in the country. Uh, Dr. Horace Yong, welcome. The floor is yours. Okay, many thanks for having me today. Uh, I'm going to bring up my slides first. 
So uh, let me see. Okay, so hopefully you can see my slide. So in line with my colleagues from Japan and also Singapore, so I'm going to put the context of uh, today's topic uh, in the context of Hong Kong. So uh, to begin with, so just a snapshot about Hong Kong, because honestly, not all people know where Hong Kong is, because some people say that Hong Kong is part of Japan. Don't be surprised by this, because uh, I have seen plenty of um, examples like that. So, but Hong Kong uh, now is part of China. It's a small place with uh, 7 million people. It used to be under the rule of uh, Britain, but however, the sovereignty has returned to China since the 1st of July 1997. But however, in a lot of ways, uh, Hong Kong still has retained uh, the system inherited from the UK. Because Hong Kong is a very small place, so uh, there are not many universities there. So there are only eight public universities. But at the same time, there are some smaller institutions, so mainly private. But however, because these institutions are teaching focused, so I don't think they are very relevant in the context of the topic today. So our focus will be on the eight public universities in Hong Kong. So uh, in my view, to do good research, you need talents, time, and also money. So my presentation will structure around these three points uh, with the focus on the final point about money. So uh, the first two points, talents and time. So uh, just like what uh, Professor Ivano has shown us regarding uh, the situation in Japan. So I also want to show you um, the rankings of university uh, in Hong Kong. So I would say they are very well ranked in the context of Asia and also by the world standard. So on the table on the right hand side, so you can see uh, the rankings of uh, the top five universities in Hong Kong. So for example, according to the TFG ranking, University of Hong Kong is ranked 35 and then UST 47 and then SU Hong Kong 57. Uh, and the City University 126, and then Hong Kong Polytechnic University 171. So you can see because we have some very prestigious universities in Hong Kong, so uh, there's not much a problem for this university to attract talents all around the world. And then also you may want to know that actually um, the benefits of working in a Hong Kong University is very good. So for example, a typical professor, I will estimate that they can earn 20,000 uh, USD uh, per month. So it's very good salary. So if you want to good, earn better salary, possibly you need to go to the US. So that's why if you look at the profile pages of uh, academic staff in Hong Kong, so you can see most of them actually have a PhD from the top 10 universities in the world. And then in relation to time, so you may want to know that so in Hong Kong, so uh, for all the people in Hong Kong, they have uh, the longest working hours in Hong Kong. So it's not pretty surprising because actually it's quite typical in Asia. So here I named Japan, South Korea, and also I believe Singapore will be the same case. So to uh, return to the attention of money, because I, I say uh, the focus of today is about the allocation of uh, research resources to this university. So uh, the process in the UK is overseen by a body called UGC, University Grants Committee. So there are two types of money flowing into the universities in Hong Kong. So at the university level, we have a type of money, we call it for grants. So when we say block grant, so the process is pretty automatic. So as long as, so here I have uh, written down the name of an exercise, we call it research assessment exercise. So as long as you have done well in this uh, RAE, so you will be able to get the money pretty automatically without doing uh, anything. So other than this uh, university level block grant, so, uh, 
There's also chance for staff to get money to fund their own research projects. So we call them competitive funding fees. So again, uh, this process is administered by the UGC, but uh, there is a specific division within uh, UGC to monitor, to regulate the process. So it's the uh, RGC, Research Grant Councils. So uh, if the staff in a university would like to apply for funding from the RGC, there are four major options. So for example, the GLF, the General Research Fund, and then also for an uh, early career researcher, so here we are talking about, uh, for example, a new PhD to who has a new position uh, with uh, Hong Kong University within three years of starting their job. So they will be entitled to apply for the earlier career scheme. And then uh, also, if you want to assemble a research team, then uh, the collaborative research fund uh, will be uh, good for uh, such a purpose. And then finally, they also have uh, the fellowship. So uh, this is mainly to buy out the research time of academic staff too, if they want to engage in a project. So here you can see a breakdown of uh, funds from RGC, so allocated to these uh, four major schemes. So we can see a substantial portion of money will go to uh, the uh, GLF, the uh, General Research Fund, and then uh, a portion will go to uh, early career scheme. But of course, if you can see uh, the, from the number of funded projects and also the amount uh, lost as, as large as the general research fund. And then uh, also uh, a substantial part of the money will also go to the collaborative research schemes. And then finally, only a very limited amount of money will go to the fellowship scheme. So uh, if you look at a grand uh, bigger picture, so you can see the part of the money for the competitive fees uh, is around 1.2 billion uh, per year. So uh, if you want to compare it, for example, with the situation of the UK, which I'm going to talk about later. So for each year, so uh, in the UK, so the portion of money available for competitive bids will be around 2.8 billion pounds per year. So in case you don't know about the currency exchange rate, then I have done the calculation of you. So the difference will be about 20 times. So the portion of money available in the UK for the staff, academic staff to apply for, to fund their funding bid is 20 times more uh, than the pot of money available in Hong Kong. But however, as uh, Professor Iwano has already done for the case of Japan, so there's not so much meaning to just look at the raw figure. So at the same time, you have to look at the GDP, the size of the economy as well. So GDP in the UK, so around 2.8 trillion uh, US dollars, and then GDP for Hong Kong around uh, 360. 62 billion US dollars, so around 10 times. So the size of the economy of the UK is around 10 times larger than the UK, than Hong Kong. So as a result, if you take into account of the GDP, then apparently uh, the funding gap between uh, UK and also Hong Kong is not actually that large. Indeed, so the total amount of money allocated from UGC to universities in Hong Kong, actually the total pot of money uh, around amounted to uh, 21 billion uh, Hong Kong dollars. But however, this pool of money actually will cover both teaching and research. So if you take it deep further and then look at so uh, how much money will be specifically allocated for research, then for the broad grants, then uh, because if you look at the figure, so it will be around 23% of this very large chunk of money. So we are talking about 5 billion Hong Kong dollars. So compare these broad grants with the uh, money available for the competitive fees. So apparently it is of paramount importance for the Hong Kong institution to do well in the RAE, Research Assessment uh, Exercise, because uh, a larger uh, block of money is available. So 
in order to do well in the RAE risk assessment exercise, so you have to make sure um, the staff in the university can publish uh, very good publications. And also their research will be able to generate impact beyond the academia. And then also you have to make sure that the research institution is able to provide a favorable research environment for the staff there. So uh, I think that is pretty much uh, what I want to say today. But in case you want to know more about uh, the state of the Hong Kong uh, higher education and also research sector, then I will encourage you to look at, uh, for example, the website of the UGC. And then in particular for the LAE research assessment exercise. So you can also go to the link here to look at what this is about. And then uh, one more thing that I perhaps I think you will find useful will be a report uh, published by Rank Corporation uh, regarding the Hong Kong Research Council. So I think then uh, that is everything uh, for my presentations. So, uh, so I will hand the scene back to Kalida. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Horace Young for your excellent presentation. And now I would like to give the floor to the fourth speaker of our panel. This is Dr. Kilje An. He is an associate professor at School of Arts and Architecture of Opijan Dal Global University at Haryana, India. Uh, before uh, this position, uh, Dr. An also taught at Kukmin University in Seoul, Republic of Korea. He has been involved in such projects as the development of intelligent AI management support system based on extended reality for on-site support for construction field and remote collaboration with the Ministry of uh, Commerce, Industry and Energy in Korea, also in the development of architectural IT collaboration service platform using MR technology with the Korean Ministry of Commerce, Industry and Energy. Dr. An, thank you very much for being with us today and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this table. My name is Kyu Jae Han. I'm coming from the OP Jinder University, India. It may seem strange for a person working at the India University to talk about Korea government research project policy. I started working in India in 2020, and before that, I was working at, uh, as an assistant professor at Kumin University in Korea and participated in many government research projects, and I'm still participating. So I accept this question because I think I can talk about my experience as a consumer of the Korean Government Resource Institute Operation Service. As one of the engineer researcher, I would like to talk about government research project in Korea. Yes, um, Korea's total R&D costs of 2018 was 4.81% uh, of GDP of its previously from the Japanese professor told us about uh, showing some kind of a uh, yeah, worldwide research R&D costs. And it's about 72 billion US dollar, he said. And the term of the national R&D project means research and development project in the field of science and technology in which central administrative agency contributes all of body, part of its R&D expense. Then in the with the public funds or the you know, business fund, private sector. It may be exposed to a responsible, so we are using the money. It may be exposed to a responsible environment similar to the demands for accountability experienced by ordinary civil servants in that in case out state R&D project with the financial support made up of tax. In that respect, fairness in Korea, in that respect, fairness in government research object and then transparency in spending are significantly significant consideration. It's very seriously considered every year, end of semester, end of the year, they are check, checking the, all the professors, researchers, how they spend money. And then sometime, yeah, some every year there's some news about the there's uh, this use of the their funds. Create your own research project in Korea done online and it's, uh, 
online accept the judgment. So like the beginning with the when the beginning before the who's going to win the research fund or the, at the end, how the research is done. Except that everything is done by online. I think it will be similar on other countries, not only this in my country. But the Korea's research management system covers all areas related to research in Korea. Research in Korea, budget management is also linked to the dedicated credit card service and the research fund management system. So, for example, research card fraud is automatically tracked in conjunction with the credit card user's information and the geographic geographic information. So, if you use the uh, like uh, if you have a meeting on some place and then after that you can have a dinner with, with uh, the people who join the meeting but uh, if it's the location is far away from your the meeting at space it's going to be yeah you gotta have a call receive the phone call from the agency later on like a two, very next day so it covers too much territory to be considered a research management system so So oh, this kind of huge, very complex management system in the past, various government ministries in Korea have uh, set up in the, their own research institute and done separate tasks. So it means every one, every government ministry or the department have uh, their own control the, this kind of system. Not like Japan, Japan has uh, only had controlled by the one seems like a control by one place, but uh, in Korea, like every play, every ministry have their own. It produces, so you, from the, it produced a similar research test that only had a different subject. It was waste of process sometime. And then it also waste of government resources. Of course, it was a convenient for service for user like us. Of course, it was a uh, inconvenient for service user like us. Most of all, I think it's because of the gener generalization of the complex research projects that are increasingly difficult for government agents to see clearly. Because uh, used to be, um, from my experience, about 10 years ago, when I was working at the university in Korea, I participated in the first government project that was ordered by the government agency in charge of national territory development. Um, but it was a study on sensor network and civil, civic service for smart cities. Actually, this is not, the, oh, I'm, I'm based on architecture field. So it's target is the smart cities, sim city itself. But uh, actually what I did is very similar to what ICT service do. So it might be relate to the public service department or the other service like uh, ICT information and communication ministry. They might be have a similar project keep going on I, because and then this what does just target this different. It could be a, they are targeting a normal people, the normal citizenship or the IT system they are looking for to develop. But actually what they develop and what we did is completely almost same thing. Just different is the target. So those things is a very happen often before. So today the majority research tasks are managed in one service. Oh, this I show is share the information with you later on. And the research funding management oh, and then research funding management system and research performance research management system are all integrated. It's going to be soon. And then some is still divided, but uh, mostly connecting to one place. Okay. Um, can you share, see my screen? Okay. Yes, uh, I'm interested in one of the service called name is the uh, Ministry of Science ICT National Science Technology Information Service. Uh, 
This is the name, NTIS is a minister, may, governed by the Minister of Science of ICT, but the pro, this service is uh, covering the other ministries and then dep department work too, department research area. So I, wait a second. Yes. Okay, is it disconnected? Dr. Kalida, okay. Okay, NTIS National Science and Technology Information Portal that integrates and they provide information, including program, project, human resources, and then outcomes of national R&D programs. Actually, it covers every kind of life cycle of the every research project. So you can, if you connect on this website, you can find every research project done in South Korea on the ongoing subject in South Korea. Not every, but uh, most of the subject you can find from this site. So this one is uh, have a lot of service, not only supporting our research project, but also a user intelligence service, strengthening user communication, enhancing corporate. So this is like a kind of portal service covering up the whole the research project, national R&D information. And then they keep including service on this site. So, but still there is other sites remaining, but on this site, what you can do is before, when I when I want to do a research about uh, our place, so sometimes my research is agriculture, sometimes my research is on land infrastructure and transport, I need to stop by every research institute on the their in their ministers because so it's going to be a lot. So it's not very hard to find out, and then collaboration is not working well on those days. But uh, like a few years back, they tried to combine everything into one place. And then if you enter into this website, you can see this is like this. Oh, this is Korean. Yes, this is like a, one of the main page of the research R&D. When you enter into this website, you will see that uh, there's a lot of, you know, one is the police department, one is the um, human resource department, um, human resource minister, and those kind of every info part of the public government sector is connecting on one place. So maybe on here, when you see the relevant government project is, uh, it will be, you know, acceptance days and this is deadline of the, and then after you, you go inside and submit your project. You choose the project and you submit your presentation. If you, if you get that project, this project is keep going on. If so, I mean, in here, you can, from the beginning to the end, and then after that, in South Korea, we have a five years of the back. After you finish the project, you still have a five years to follow up the project. For the thing, for the follow up the, the follow up research, and you can but so not only researchers, every any of the people who have a Korean citizenship who are working for the discount research area, they can they can see your project is going well or not. So this kind of thing information is very helpful, but uh, I feel like uh, sometimes this kind of research project is. Uh, but this is follow-up, so how I say, the people who can see clearly what they do, how they spend the money by the researchers. It's like, a, I don't know, people who saw the Korean government working for the COVID virus. And they're in Korea, people searching their, what they, you know, that the people who infected by the COVID-19 and then people find out what they do and where they went by the credit card. It's kind of, yeah, sometimes it's kind, sometimes I feel like it's too much, but actually, yeah, definitely it's helping make it 
career budget use. Dear Dr. Ahn, thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry to ask, we are running a little bit uh, out of time. Okay. Uh, and may I kindly ask all our speakers from the Southeast Asian uh, panel to join us. We have a few questions from our participants. Thank you very much uh, to all of you for your excellent presentations. And um, uh, Dr. Kilje Ahn, thank you very much for your excellent presentation as well. It was very uh, informative. And now let me ask you a few questions. So the first question we have is about the business investments in research in uh, your countries. To what extent does business invest um, to research and whether there are any tax uh, preferences for the businesses that invest in research and development. Um, and so we would like to know how the government motivates uh, local uh, business people to invest more uh, in research area. Thank you. So any one of you uh, can start and other speakers are welcome also to add. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think for Japan, the state budget model is quite important. Because uh, government policy together with funding is very strong. You know, people compete for the funding with new ideas and produce good practice, good model. And that spread throughout Japan. But uh, social investment model may be also useful, like uh, Go, 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 Global, Go Global Japan project. Uh, it's a one big funding uh, from state and also from the uh, companies uh, with that one budget was shared to send the student to abroad so you know it depends on how to combine two models okay yeah, Kalida, can i help well basically uh the private sector if you're a young scientist you're encouraged to do a startup government will provide support up to one third funding equity and you will have to find two thirds but basically uh, the government can also give a loan in its in the equity so you are given equity one third so that the majority will be the owner plus a third party so there are three parties and grants from the government is uh, non-recoverable they're given so the incentives for the young people to come up the challenge to find experience in managing startups it's not knowledge. So we have to find people who know how to do startups. So the, what we have done now is to use uh, recruiting people from overseas to help the young scientists to run the business. Knowledge is one thing, but experience of running a business is another challenge. So the incentives, when the company succeeds, uh, they have again tax holiday, funding, full funding. Uh, and the way is basically they are free to also uh, invite new investors. So the freedom is with the young scientists to do the startup. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Horace Young, please, uh, would you like to add? I, I do have the figures on my hand, uh, but however, I believe uh, for all the universities, for all the research projects, so there must be a degree of co-investment, so, uh, so funding from the government and also uh, funding from the companies. But however, I believe uh, the major funding model will still be uh, government dominated because the problem is so in Hong Kong, the economic pillars are the real estate companies and also um, the financial institutions. For the real estate companies, to be honest, they don't need uh, any advanced research at all because it's about uh building the houses and then sell the houses to make a progress and then also for the financial institutions so they have their in-house research department so as a result so although i don't have the figures on my hand so just like what i say but i believe uh, for the model in hong kong it's still largely uh, government dominated mm -hmm. thank you very much uh, Dr. An, yes. would you like to add anything about the invest business investment and whether there are any tax policies and preferences uh, to support businesses that invest in research? Oh yes, uh, of course. Like uh, although the relative barriers depending on the subject of study, there is a private contribution. Like I, I think it's similar to other country, but uh, in particular in my area, like uh, the entire has a share of the thirty to fifty percent. 
for tasks such as uh, acquiring technology or they can make you know, some kind of product helping product. So in that case, about maximum is 50%. That's what I experienced. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Dr. An. And now we have two questions from our uh, from our audience. So the first question is asked by uh, Professor Habibullah Bismildin. He is interested uh, in uh, research in academic startups. And his question is, to what extent is it possible to develop science through academic startups? For example, at the first level, due to deductions from business and the population like crowdfunding, at the second level, with the involvement of a business share, business partner, and at the third level of the investor, while the state money should be considered as a startup funds. Uh, we've heard uh, about the startups uh, in Singapore. So, um, dear colleagues, uh, would you like uh, to add uh, about academic startups and whether we can um, uh, develop science through academic startups? Sorry, um, I couldn't hear your question well, but I can see the question at the bottom. But I, I think in Japan, it, it depends on the nature of the society. And uh, this kind of uh, a model is very, you know, a beginning in our country. So I don't know how it works. Sorry, I can't answer well to this question. It's OK, thank you. Uh, other colleagues, please, would you like to add your opinions? Oh, about the academic yes. startup. Dr. An? Yes. Um, in South Korea, this kind of uh, fund is very encouraged by the government because a uh, new college university graduate can hard to get a job these days. So it's few government is encouraged student to find do uh, this kind of project, find out this find their ideas and then start their business. So yes. It is, there is a lot of the fund is uh, prepared for them. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Horace Young? I think in the case of Hong Kong, uh, if you look at startup, it is not a country or it's not a place that you should look at. I think one example that I can give today will be DJI. So if you have ever heard of this name, DJI is the largest manufacturer in the world of UAV a manned aerial vehicle or in short, drone or those mini helicopters. So the origin of DJI was actually a PhD project in Hong Kong UST, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. But however, the Hong Kong government or the universities has really failed to nurture DJI properly. So as a result, so Mr. Wang Tao, so the founder of DJI, has moved back to China, Shenzhen, to start his business. So I think from the example of DJI, you can see uh, if you talk about academic startup, Hong Kong actually is a failure, unfortunately. <laughs> That's what I can say. Thank you, thank you very much. And we have our last question, question from the audience, Mr. Ashad Janibek. And uh, he says, um, he, his question is about, you know, the academic culture at universities. And he asks, what should be the first steps that will form academic research culture and practice at local universities in line with common high academic research standards? So basically, how should we create uh, this uh, academic culture and research culture at universities that could help uh, promote and develop uh, research? Thank you. Um, to this end, I can't hear uh, questions well. So can I answer the last? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Mm. Yes, the, the question that was asked, it was uh, basically deals with uh, the issue of um, plagiarism and maybe some other uh, practices, um, non-ethical practices uh, in research. Uh, and uh, our, uh, uh, the member of our audience, he has asked, yes, uh, what should be done, what could be done to establish um, a good uh, academic culture, research culture um, at the university. Well, from Singapore experience, because most of our students are educated in the U.S., 
uh, in the UK. So they bring the same value of respecting intellectual property. So I don't see us having this problem of uh, plagiarism in that as much. Secondly, is that most of the publications they publish in Science Nature, so they are on international journals. So I think so far we have been quite fortunate. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So, um, dear speakers, would like anyone to add? Okay, I think uh, on this point, we will wrap up the discussion for this panel. Again, many thanks to all our distinguished speakers uh, at this panel for your fantastic presentations. We learned a lot about the practices of uh, science governance and research management in your countries. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. And now I will be giving the floor to the speakers of the next session who will talk about the practices of research management and uh, science governance in Europe, UK and Canada. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Halida. Uh, so we are moving to our next session, and I would like to give the floor to President of Sinayoki University of Applied Science, Finland, Jako Halila. Please, Jako, floor is yours. Tell us about uh, Finnish model of research in higher education, please. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here here today. The discussion has been very interesting, and I'm. I'm happy to be part of this event and hopefully you can hear my voice and, and see see the cam. I'm trying to uh, share the screen at the moment, if you are able to see it. All right, hopefully you can see, see it this time. So I will start by telling a little bit about the about the Finnish education model. Uh, in Finland, the model is very similar to many of the European countries, and I myself come from the University of Applied Sciences side, uh, from Saint York University of Applied Sciences, and we give the the, the bachelor degrees and master's degrees. Uh, also, there are the traditional science universities giving giving the doctorate and licentiate decrease uh, all of the photos by the way are from from our university of applied sciences in in Seineoki. so i will not tell so much about our university but but i guess pictures speak louder than words so in finland the the government and minister the government of uh, the ministry of education and culture is governing uh, the higher education in Finland, and they formulate and implement the education policy. And, uh, and basically the Finnish National Board of Education is responsible for implementation of the policy. Uh, in Finland, both universities and universities of applied sciences are supervised by the Ministry of Education and Culture. And what is quite interesting, we do four, four year agreements uh, which are performance agreements uh, with the with the government of Finland or with the ministry, and we we basically agree, agree on common aims, mission, profile, and focus areas, and and uh, the targets. Yeah, there's the word financing. Uh, nothing comes for free uh, in, in in Finland. Everything comes uh, comes by results. I will tell a little bit more about that. But the government does some monitoring and evaluation. What is quite unique for the, for the universities of applied sciences in Finland, they are limited liability companies, uh, owned often by the municipalities. And as you saw, after my uh, title president, there was also the title CEO. So we basically run a company, even though our fun funding comes mainly from, mainly from the public sector. So in, in case of Seneca University of Applied Sciences, for example, we are owned by four of the main municipalities in our region. And the city of Seineoki is, is our majority shareholder. So regardless of the ownership, uh, about 82% of the gross income is funded by the government. And, and the total amount of government funding is decided on a yearly basis within the state budget and based on the funding model. Uh, and uh, in our case, for example, 
14.6% of the funding comes from, from R&D projects. And we also sell education. We have education services and expert services that we provide. And we also get private donations. Uh, last year in Finland, there was a, uh, there was a sort of test that um, to, to boost the, boost the private donations to universities. And uh, if we collected donations for the from the companies, for every one euro we received from a company, we, we were given another euro by the government. And for, for example, in our case, it, it was a, quite a successful thing. We received quite a quite good amount of funding from the companies to develop our university and our, our research. Uh, I hope you can see even a little bit of this. It's, it's not very clear, the, the, the slide. Uh, this is the interesting, interesting thing about the feature of the Finnish model. We get, as I said, our funding totally by the results. So here uh, up, you can see the, the degrees. Uh, Dr. Yako, sorry. Yeah. Uh, can you press full screen? Okay, I, I pressed full screen. This is in interesting if you are if it's not showing. I have it on on full screen mode. So we we are seeing only first page of your uh, presentation. So can you do full screen? So technical issue. Um, are you able to see me now? Yeah, yeah. So can you share your screen again? Yes. Were you able to see the slides I, I was showing? Okay. So we're not seeing right now. Okay. What about right now? Yes. So can you do a full screen of this one? It's not on full screen mode. No. Interesting. So can you can you move to another slide? Uh, yes, I I have been moving. Uh, I'm now in in the middle. But of we are not seeing. Okay, let's our colleagues will share your uh, presentation. Okay, I'm David, sorry. can you please share so you can stop sharing your screen? So yeah. then we will share. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One second, I will share. Which slide should I present? Uh, there is about the the funding of the University of Applied Sciences, core funding. Yes, oh, yeah. that one. Basically, yeah, basically now we can see a slide. Yes, what about... Oops. Technical issues. Internet. Down in Litva. Finland. What about... Now in Litva. When I'm trying to do the full screen, it kicks me out of the room. Okay, no problem. Uh, I will. I will do it. Which slide? Okay. Should... Thank you very much. Which slide Sorry, should I... Technical technical issue. So just just show the slides, and after uh, Jako will uh, tell you which slides. Okay. Okay. I was Thank in a slide with some blue bars showing the. Showing okay, Jako, the... you can continue without slides. Slide will appear right now. So, but you can continue. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that one. This specific slide I was in. Yes. So about the about the financing, uh, it comes from from the degrees that we that we give. For example, if we are if we agree with the government that we produce certain amount of degrees, um, we get funding from each degree we produce. However, we don't get a degree. Uh, we don't get funding if we produce more than what we agreed on. Uh, so that's one of the interesting feature in, in the Finnish system. Also, every R&D euro that our university gets, we, uh, for example, if we win a bid in Horizon, uh, Horizon Europe or Horizon 2020, we get another euro from the Finnish government every time we, we get funding. So this is an interesting feature. There are lots of other indicators, like how, how if, if our students graduate in time, that gives us some extra funding. But I think we have no, no time to go too much into the details as, as we are running late, so we can change the slide. Yes, uh, when it comes to the traditional science universities, 
uh, in in their case, um, it's also the the research is ranked uh, by the journals. Uh, the how, how difficult the journal is to publish, so you get more funding uh, by how how difficult the the journal is to publish. But maybe we can move move on because the, I have still slides. Uh, the education and R and D in universities of applied sciences um, we work especially on the regional level and, and with the companies. Uh, and we can move to the next slide as we are a bit late. Uh, the Finnish education system consists on 13 universities and 24 universities of applied sciences. And uh, SEAM is one of the really uh, top ones. We have the highest uh, uh, student satisfaction, best learning environments and our uh, students uh, start more companies, private companies, than uh, other others. And also, we use the business lecturers from the business um, much more than other universities. And these are all, all financing indicators by, by the ministry. So we, it, it, it's, it's a good thing for us. And 11 of our, our uh, bachelor degree programs are in, in top three of Finland and and of us as well as four of our master's programs. We can move on. Uh, in Finland, there are also the public research institutes which work under the minis ministries. For example, VTT, which is quite well known, they, they work un under the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Employment and they, they do a lot of research. Usually they are uh, mission-oriented and, and uh, there are different tasks that these, these institutes do have. We can move on. Uh, then the research is uh, concluded in, in numerous other public or private research institutes or, or individual organizations. And approximately two thirds of Finnish research and development takes place in the companies. So, and, and companies engage a significant amount of innovation when it comes to Finland and uh, this means new products and, and services and, and, and a lot of scientific research also done in the private companies. There are examples even, even here in Seinöki, which is not a very big town, but, but companies producing scientific material. So we can move on. Uh, the, the research funders in Finland, they are both public and private sector, and private sector invests heavily in research and, and, and development. We have only uh, 5.4 million people in Finland, and, and the flow of investments from the private sector was 6.4 billion euros in, in 2018, for example. Uh, in, in our case, uh, the government is the main source of funding for universities and universities of applied sciences. And, but additionally, the funding by the private foundations has been instrumental. Uh, I have an example about that as well, but we can move on. A public research funding in Finland and how it is governed, the Ministry of Education, Science and Culture uh, has definitely an important role, as I mentioned. The Ministry of Economic Affairs and Employment uh, does a lot of uh, funds a lot of research, which is a sort of combining the business, the companies, and and the uh, us universities. Uh, also, other ministries have are, are have duties, and I would say Business Finland is very much a, a fund which combines the scientific research. And, and, the, and the business research. So I, I have a slide about that later on. Academy of Finland is more of a traditional science financer. We can move on. Uh, the R&D in Finland, uh, it's 2.7% of the gross domestic product. It could be a bit more, but uh, I guess it's, it's, a, it's quite, quite a good level. Uh, this is the amount of degrees produced in, in Finland. We can move on. Uh, the expenditure in Finland by uh, R&D expenditure, uh, there has been some, um, if, if we look at the years 2015 and 16, uh, it was not uh, increasing, uh, rather it was decreasing those years. The last few years there has been 
slight increase. We can move on. And we can move on. Uh, the, the, there is a strategy by the Ministry of Education and Culture. And as you can see in the middle, the public-private partnership is an essential part of it. Uh, I think we do not have more time to go into details. We can move to the next slide. Uh, and uh, education and learning knowledge is, 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 um, and, and technology for the benefits of people and society is, a, is an important thing. We have a goal that over 50% of young people complete a higher education degree. This is probably uh, enough from this slide. We can move on. Uh, we have also the roadmap for implementing the vision and there are very similar things as in the strategy. Perhaps we can move on. So the strategy for national research infrastructures in Finland, the main objectives are promoting quality renewal and competitiveness of research and strengthening the broad-based impact of research environments and increasing national and international cooperation. Please move on. Uh, so you can see sustainable development, long-term perspective and dynamism and ownership and know-how, digital platforms and data, and open access is a very important thing and, and wide and versatile impact. So we always have to demonstrate the impact as, as a university, also to the government when they do the, uh, when, they, when they check us up. So open science, basically, for example, in Seineck University of Applied Sciences, we try that all of the research material we co collect, we, we use open access principle so that the same material can be uh, late, used at the later stage also by, by other researchers. We can move on. The, uh, the Academy of Finland is a, like a very traditional financer of a very high level research in Finland. And they, uh, it's a very competitive program and usually for very experienced scientists. Uh, it's it's uh, supported by, uh, by the Finnish government and, and under the Ministry of Education and, and Culture. We can move on. That is one of the main main funds in Finland. Then Business Finland, as I mentioned, um, they are more more of a fund for for doing cooperation between universities and and businesses, and um, it's it's a great way to combine uh, funding from both from private sector and and from business sector. And this was under the Ministry of. Uh, employment and economy. We can move on. Uh, there are uh, very good business cases, for example, which are financed by the financed by the Business Finland program. For example, Nokia uh, does a, quite a wide range of cooperation between uh, with different universities in Finland when when it comes to development of the 5G networks and Neste, which is a traditional traditional producer of fuels, they have created the new biofuels from waste. And even in, in my, my town, you can buy, you can fuel your car with biofuels. It's, it's basically everywhere in, in Finland available already. Uh, Fortum and Metsa Group, they, they have, yeah, they have created some, some bio-based materials. And the parliament, uh, there's a fund directly uh, under the Finnish parliament, which is called Citra. And their aim is to support science in low carbon and circular economy and renewability of the society, and especially future prediction. Uh, Citra has continuous call for, call for projects. We can move on. Uh, so, uh, then there are also private foundations, such as Kone Foundation, which offers grants. We can move on, perhaps. And. Uh, I was asked about the private support and the, the tax benefits when it comes to Finland and a company company can basically donate a, uh, from 850 to 250 thousand euros per year to, to a research organization which is registered and approved by the tax authority. Uh, for example, if a company makes a profit of 250 thousand euros, uh, they would otherwise pay tax from that. But if they decide they could even the whole amount they could they could uh, 
donate to, to for example, us as a university. Uh, a, a large company with a, with big, bigger profits, if they wish, they can donate uh, uh, to several organizations. So there's no limit how many how many organizations they donate. Uh, sorry for the technical problems in the beginning, uh, and, and this is my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you, Jaka. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, a little bit later, we will have a discussion about your uh, presentation. And let me give a, a floor to our another colleagues from Lithuania. Actually, the experience of Lithuania is very important for us because we have uh, Soviet Union heritage, and that's why the experience of Lithuania can be uh, applicable for maybe Kazakhstani uh, reality. Uh, Montes Landaukas, professor, a state professor, Kalmas University of Technology, Lithuania. Please, uh, Montes, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope you can see my slides. So I will talk a little bit about uh, science management in Lithuania. We will have three points and uh, the management at the top level, then strategic program documents and maybe a little bit more about research funding. So Lithuania, as you can see, is almost or maybe exactly on the geographical center of the Europe, quite a small country, 2.8 million inhabitants. Our GDP is almost 50 billion uh, USD. And in total for science, technology, innovation, we are spending almost 1% of GDP. Also, we have some plans to increase it to 1.9, and we will see how it goes in the future. So the main science management happens uh, at the top level via the Ministry of Education, Science and Sport. It's the, quite a long name, uh, probably due to the savings and uh, Similar reasons, we're just having one minister, not many ministries for all those different fields. And it is responsible for, at first, implementing the national system of formal and non-formal education. And also, uh, it is responsible for creating conditions for learning and uh, changing society to be more democratic and uh, more modern. As you can see, also it is responsible for implementing state policy of science, studies, and other legal acts, the coordinating the activity of Lithuanian institutions of science and studies is also under the responsibility of this ministry. We have two more agencies which are very important in science management. So the first one is the Agency for Science, Innovation and Technology. It was introduced in 2010. And the main purpose is to, like we say, implement innovation policy in Lithuania. That happens through several stages. For example, it can announce calls for science projects, which can be dedicated only for scientists. They also can be dedicated for joint teams of scientists and business. Sometimes uh, half of the funding comes from the government and half of the funding comes from the business, it depends on the actual call. And in many cases, it depends also on the size of the company which needs the service from scientists. If it's a small company, it gets more funding. If it's a larger company, it gets less funding. And also the agency is responsible to make accelerations for startups and young businesses. So they are making events and some other promotions. Another institution is Research Council of Lithuania. And mainly it is some sort of expert and consultational body. It's also implementing uh, the science development on a national level, but it is more dedicated to research, to be in particular, not for the business, not for the um, projects for the business, but for the research. And it also announces a huge part of the projects in the country. We call those just uh, national projects. The funding might be very various, from maybe tens of thousands of euros up to several hundred thousands of euros, it depends. And 
one university can get the funding or several universities can get the funding, it also depends. So also this institution implements uh, the administration for Athenian, Athenian science development programs and evaluates research performance, which is quite important. Uh, every five years, universities are evaluated to, in comparison to all the other universities in Lithuania, and because of the, of the score, they can get a certain amount of funding. So this is quite an important point. We also have yearly evaluation, but those are not uh, such important. And of course, the council represents Lithuania at European and international level. So what about the documents? So the main document is the law on science and studies, and it describes many things. You can see in the list those things. So those are regulation of science and studies, quality assurance of science and studies, and this one has a separate legal act, just uh, the law of studies and higher education. So we can also talk here about legal aspects of opening, restructuration, and closing of study institutions. If you want to do that, you need to comply with the law. Uh, we, you also need to comply for steering and monitoring activities in your institution to this law and so on. And well, funding of science and study of and in institutions also is uh, covered in this law. That's just at some small extent. We also have asset management principles defined in this law, and those are the main things which this is responsible for. We have some smaller legal acts, but those are not the main governing acts. And if we talk about, for example, the current situation, so maybe probably the most important thing is futures economics DNA. This is sort of a plan, a strategy, which aims at the long term, but actually which is only about up to 2021, end of that year. And it will try to spread 6.9 billion euros among the economy of Lithuania, including all the existing programs from Science Council, from META, from other agencies, and plus some additional funding. So that amount of budget is intended to accelerate the economics in Lithuania, of course, including research and experimental development and innovation and teaching and other things. So it is coordinated by the Ministry of Finance. And if we talk about the research funding, Probably, as in many countries, we have lots of funding from H2020 and other projects, like international funding. Uh, we have also funding from national programs, from those I have mentioned, and from several others. For example, other ministries like Ministry of Health uh, sometimes announce calls for better society, for helpful aging and other uh, important matters. So we have additional support from that also. Uh, and from national projects, we have support for science and business collaboration. The one I mentioned before, when the part of the expenses for that task to be completed is covered by the government. And some specific calls, of course. We have institutional calls. Those are inside the university. And they happen not always, but well, Almost everywhere, we have, every, every year we have one or two. Sometimes they're dedicated for experienced researchers, sometimes they are dedicated for young researchers. So for small you know, projects, teams of two to five at most probably people, depending on the call. And usually the budget is quite small. But, well, in H 2020 you talk about millions sometimes, and national calls you talk about hundreds of thousands. In institutional calls, you talk at well, at most twenty thousand or ten or ten thousand euros for one year for a team of two to five researchers. But that's a good start to just show a good example for our younger colleagues to introduce those to the machine of science funding. So the state program like Future DNA, Future Economics DNA, it also will have additional funding which is not decided yet, but it is developing at the moment. 
And we have contracts with businesses for research or services. So mainly if, uh, if a company needs something innovative, a new product, maybe new computation, or new expert decision, they can contact university and they can just do that contract individually without any funding from the outside. And that's also quite common and some of the funding is coming from that. Uh, for example, our university, if we talk about the funding for the research, so about 70% of funding comes from the state and about 30% of funding comes from uh, contracts with businesses. Uh, so that's small information about research in Lithuania. If you will have some questions, that will be nice to answer those. Thank you, thank you very much, Marta. Uh, so we will have uh, some discussion a little bit later. So, according to Global Innovation Index, uh, one of the top countries is uh, Sweden. So, that's why let me give uh, the next speech to our uh, speaker from uh, Lund University, Professor Kenneth Persson. Please, Professor Kenneth, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Barsan, and I'm happy to participate in this interesting uh, seminar on, on uh, research financing. May I ask you to show my slide? Thank you. Yes. I will talk a little bit about Swedish research, research and innovation. And Sweden is uh, a country that is uh, very open for economy and uh, has a large share of the gross national product going to um, export. Um, the government is the most important source for research funding. Uh, and uh, it's organized through the Ministry of Education. Uh, and uh, however, uh, they bring in, uh, in the area of 50% um, of all the research funding going to the universities in Sweden. And um, other important funders are also special councils, councils for research funding. And also the uh, Agency for Innovation Systems, VINAOVA. Uh, a big share uh, in range of 10% comes from uh, research foundations and European Union and also from uh, source, public sources from uh, municipalities and uh, regions, county councils. Uh, but uh, looking on the actual amount of money uh, channeled to research, uh, the private funds are in the range of three times bigger than, than the governmental funds. However, the private money is typically remaining in the business sector and not so much uh, uh, reaches the universities. Next slide, please. Uh, the research councils uh, are uh, very important since they open for uh, all researchers at Swedish universities who can apply for uh, uh, external fundings outside the universities. The biggest one is the so-called Swedish Research Council, Wetenskapsrådet, that funds uh, about 7 billion Swedish crowns, that's about 700 million euros, for basic research in uh, sciences, technology, medicine, but also in humanities and social sciences. Uh, a little bit smaller funder is the Swedish Research Council for Environment, Agriculture, Sciences and Special Planning, uh, abbreviated FORMAS, but uh, gives money for basic and needs-driven research in uh, environment, land-based industries, special, special planning, uh, agriculture, forestry, uh, and uh, they uh, funded last year uh, uh, about 1.8 billion Swedish crowns in uh, research and uh, 100, about 180 million euros. Uh, a special council is the Swedish Research Council for Health, Working Life and Welfare, Forte. Uh, they give 67 million uh, euros, or they gave last year, and they are aiming at basic and needs-driven research in the labor market, work organization, public health, welfare, social services and social relations research area. And then we have this uh, innovation uh, funder, Vinova, uh, and they aim for uh, very much uh, needs-driven research, practical research in technology, transport, communication, working life. And they funded last year 
305 million euros. And they have normally requirements on co-financing from uh, private or public actors so that um, they uh, they fund and then they expect a, uh, additional funding from uh, external funders so that the, the total amount going to innovation is by far bigger than these 305 million euros. Uh, then uh, there are a number of other um, authorities that have special research uh, funding like the authority for traffic or the authority for uh, uh, water and sea or the authority for um, energy so yeah there are a number of authorities but they are in a smaller scale they're typically uh, one to ten percent in smaller than uh, one to ten percent of what we see here from on the bigger uh, research councils next slide thank you uh, in addition to the, the governmental funds, because all these I have shown are government examples of governmental funds, then there's also something called research foundations. And uh, the biggest research foundation is the Foundation for Strategic Research. Uh, but there's also for strategic environmental research, uh, something called Knowledge Foundation, Foundation for Baltic and East European Studies, and the Foundation for Healthcare Science and Allergy Research, the Wardal Institute. Uh, one for uh, international cooperation in research and higher education. And um, what reason why we have these number of foundations is that they, it was a political discussion in the 1990s that ended in that uh, a number of, of um, funds were allocated to uh, these um, research foundations. Uh, and they are actually... Um, quite substantial uh, they allocate in the range of uh, 15 to 50 uh, million euros a year in uh, different research programs but they are operated by separate foundations so they are not a part directly part of the government and then there are uh, additional uh, funds from uh, uh, the Bank of Sweden Tercentenary Foundation, uh, Riksbankens Jubileumsfond, um, that is maybe not so known. It's, it's mainly known internationally because they fund the Swedish Tercentenary Foundation Prize in uh, memory of Alfred Nobel in economy. So what normally is called the Nobel Prize in economy because Alfred Nobel, he didn't donate money to fund Prices for economy, but uh, this uh, this foundation, the Sweden Tercentenary Foundation, gives money every year to the Nobel Foundation, and uh, so that's why there is also one Nobel Prize in economy. Next slide, thank you. Uh, we in Sweden have a lot of private research research foundations. Uh, many are quite small, but actually some are really big and the biggest one is uh, the so-called Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation. They grant uh, normally in the range of one to two billion Swedish crowns a year, that's 200, 100 to 200 million euros. But a large uh, funder for uh, cancer research is the so-called Swedish Cancer Society that uh, uh, gave uh, 770 million uh, crowns. Uh, uh, yeah, about uh, 76 million euros for cancer research. But uh, we have uh, more than 2,000 different research foundations uh, all over Sweden, and uh, they are targeting different areas, but they're not normally not at all as big as uh, these two I show here. Next slide, please. Uh, looking on a uh, total financing of higher education and research, um, the the total budget was uh, 78 billion Swedish crowns. That's for both research and education. Uh, the public fund funding came to uh, amounted to about 80 percent, and uh, of that, um, it was direct funds from the government, about half, and uh, different uh, public finance, the other half. And the remaining 20 percent is from uh, European Union funds, uh, private funds, or uh, um, yeah. Um, uh, lo local funds, municipalities. Next, please. Uh, one way to monitor um, 
innovation is to check for patents and uh, Sweden is a part of uh, ECT, the European uh, Patent Organization. Uh, so um, a large number of patent applications go directly to Munich um, in uh, 2018. That was the last figures I managed to find. We, we had uh, 2,200 applications whereof 1,000 or 1,000 was granted. Uh, but uh, 14,000 was validated according to the ECT um, um, uh, system, with mainly for for a European uh, patent, but also for US. Uh, and uh, as you can see, it is uh, uh, not the changes are from 2017, according to the Swedish Patent Authority. So some goes up, some goes down. But uh, we have a range of. Uh, not, uh, some thousand patents per year that are granted. Next slide, please. We look on uh, activity service is in Swedish, but it says just the uh, number of published scientific papers in uh, in the peer review journals measured per million uh, inhabitants, and these are some small, medium-sized European countries. So it's Denmark, DK, Finland, Netherlands. Norway, Switzerland, and Sweden. And uh, what we can see, the Sweden is the thick black line in the middle. Uh, we are in the range of uh, 1,600 published papers per million inhabitants, and that is a little bit higher than uh, what we see for Finland and uh, Norway. And uh, uh, it's uh, a little bit lower than what we see for Denmark and uh, Switzerland. Uh, what we also can see for all the countries during the last uh, 20 years is that there has been an increase, a substantial increase in uh, published papers. And uh, it's uh, almost uh, uh, a doubling for many countries. And uh, for the Swedish figure, it's about a uh, 50% increase. Uh, to summarize uh, what I've shown here is that... Uh, the government is important for base funding of research. Uh, these uh, research councils, the governmental research councils that uh, grant money according to applications are also substantially important. Private money from private foundations are also important. And um, uh, some external funds, from a little from uh, industry, uh, a little from uh, European funds are also important. And uh, the idea in the Swedish research funding system is that there are many sources, it, meaning that the academic freedom that you can as a researcher apply for good ideas that you think that you would like to um, um, implement uh, can, if you're a little bit persistent in your work, you can find funders for that. So uh, it means that uh, it's a nice, uh, I would say, a, a pretty nice uh, setup for allowing different researchers to take initiatives. What, if we look on on uh, challenges, uh, we have one substantial challenge, and that is to get all these results from the papers and move them to innovation, and then possibly also move them to startup companies. Uh, the Vinova, uh, the Swedish Authority for for innovation. Um, they uh, support uh, startups and, and they also allocate funds to the universities every year so that each university in Sweden has an innovation board and also a, a venture capital company that can allocate some money to invest in good startup ideas. But uh, we can see that uh, we by far haven't reached the saturation of uh, bringing all the good ideas from the papers from the scientists to startup companies. So uh, that is one uh, challenge. Another challenge is uh, that different sectors in society are differently uh, efficient in using new thinking, new uh, results, and. Uh, uh, there have been a uh, search for the last, uh, I would say, 15 years to stimulate public procurement and open up for more innovative procurement. 
from the public sector. The public sector is quite big in Sweden, uh, as since Sweden is a welfare society, uh, and it means that um, if uh, public procurement would direct some of the funds to innovative uh, procurement, they could open up for uh, more innovative solutions and uh, a bigger growth of, um, uh, yeah, for instance, startup companies. We have seen that in the health sector, and uh, we have also seen that in uh, uh, the IT sector. Uh, and uh, I think that is uh, something that certainly should be considered for other countries to uh, use pro public procurement more actively. Uh, so uh, looking on that, maybe that could conclude my overview of the Swedish research sector. And I thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions. Dear Professor Persson, thank you very much for your very interesting and valuable presentation. We will have questions and answers at the end of this panel session. And now I would like to invite um, Dr. Horace Young, Associate Professor of School of Law, University of Leicester uh, in the UK. Uh, Dr. Young has already been with us, but for those who have just recently joined, let me introduce our speaker. Horace Young, apart from teaching at the University of Leicester, also taught at Exeter, Oxford, and Universitat Osnabrück. His research interests lie in corporate and financial laws, distinctively with a global comparative and interdisciplinary approach. Dr. Young also uh, does research on Central Asia, and in relation to Kazakhstan, he recently published research about the Astana International Financial Center. And recently, he has been awarded seed funding from the Economic and Social Research Council UK Impact Acceleration Account for further expanding his activities in the country. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Young. The floor is yours. So hi again. So uh, I'm going to uh, bring up my slides first. Let's see. So uh, hello. So uh, I'm going to uh, put the context of today's topic uh, in in the specific situation uh, of the UK. So again, I'm going to give a snapshot of the higher education center uh, sector in the UK. So in the UK, we have over 100 public universities. So if I need to uh, group uh, these uh, universities into different groupings. So I will roughly divide these 100 institutions into three tiers. But however, I have to add that this is just uh, my own will rather than uh, because it's, it can be quite controversial. Uh, so if there are three different groups, groupings uh, of uh, universities in the UK, so uh, one group, we can call it uh, the Russell Group Universities. So uh, they are very research intense, intensive, and also uh, they are very prestigious. At the same time, uh, they are very resourceful. Also, uh, if you look at the uh, lead table rankings of the universities, uh, most of them should perform very well. And then a uh, second group that I would like to highlight would be uh, those newer universities established after 1992. So I can say almost all of them were uh, polytechnic institutions. So uh, currently there are around 70, 70 uh, of these uh, new newer universities. So uh, when compared with the uh, Russell Group universities, so they are more uh, teaching oriented. But at the same time, I can still add that so there is a considerable level of uh, research uh, activities within this newer university. But however, their primary objective will be to uh, offer those uh, undergraduate and postgraduate degrees uh, to the students, so mainly teaching oriented. And then uh, for the rest, so I would say it is between uh, group one, uh, Russell Group Universities, and then group two, uh, New University. I think one good example of uh, the one in this third group will be uh, Leicester, because uh, we are not uh, in the Russell Group of University, but uh, I can say, so even in the third group, so we are still 
uh, on top of the third group, so just right behind the Russell Group Universities. So again, if you refer to uh, the THE uh, world rankings of universities, so uh, you can see uh, the universities in the UK are performing very well. So for example, uh, top of the table is Oxford University, so uh, which is ranked the first uh, in, in the table, and then Cambridge, the third, and then Imperial College London, the 10th, and then UCL 15, and then also London School of Economics, uh, 27. And then also uh, we have a number of other universities so which are ranked in the top 100. So in terms of the allocation of uh, resources to, to all these universities, so uh, this is actually overseen by uh, an organization uh, called uh, UKRI, UK Research and Innovation. Quite similar to uh, what I have talked about for the case of Hong Kong. So uh, you can categorize these uh, research resources into two types. So one is uh, a board grant, so which is directly allocated uh, by the government, so which is uh, pretty automatic. So you don't have to do anything at all. So as long as you have done well in an exercise, we call it REF, Research Excellence Framework. So for the next few years, then you will receive that money pretty automatically. So that's why if you want to receive this automatic money, a larger chunk of it, then you have to make sure you do well in the Research Excellence Framework, we call it REM. Just pretty much like what I have already said for the case of Hong Kong. So if you want to do well in the REF, Research Excellence Framework, you have to make sure that uh, all your academic staff in the university uh, will be able to publish high quality publications. And then also you have to make sure your research will be able to demonstrate and show impact beyond academia can make a real difference to the, uh, to the society. And then also you have to make sure that uh, your university is a favorable research uh, environment uh, for the researchers. And then other than this uh, program, so we, uh, for the academic staff, so if we want money to fund our own project so we can apply for money, for example, from the nine research councils under the UKRI. So you can see uh, an example, some examples of uh, these nine research councils under the UKRI. For example, if you are in the discipline of history, for example, then you will want to apply for money from uh, HHRC, Arts and Humanities Research Council. In my case, I'm a lawyer, so I consider my discipline in social science, that's why. And also because my research is about commercial law, business law, company law. So most likely that if I want to fund my research project, then I will apply for money from the ESRC, Economic and Social Research Council. And then also we have, you can see we have a research council for the discipline of biology and then engineer, and then also for medical research. So we also have some other um, specialist research council for some other discipline. Other than this large research council, we also have some private funders. For example, here I write down BA, I'm talking about the British Academy, and then also the Lee Fahim Trust, so which is a charity. So if you know the name Lee Fahim, then you can relate it to a very large corporation. You need Lever, so which is a very large food company. Actually, Lever Him Trust has a, co a connection with this uh, uh, very large food company, Uni Lever. And then also from the uh, presentation by Professor Pearson about Sweden, so he mentioned about uh, charities in cancer research. So similarly, we have uh, some private funders, so in the form of charities for uh, these, uh, for example, cancer research, for example. The Welcome Trust, so which largely funds a medical research, and then also for cancer research, we have Cancer Research UK. So if you are a researcher in this discipline, then you can apply for funders like this. And then lastly, also we have the EU. But however, after Brussels, then the future of our eligibility to apply for funding from the EU can be quite unclear. And then to give you some statistics, so uh. The automatic money, so the block grants from uh, the UKRI in the year 19, uh, 2019 to uh, 2020s amounted to 1.744 billion. So this money benefited uh, 124 
universities in the UK. And then in terms of the pot of money available for the competitive uh, funding bid, so uh, we have a larger pot of money at uh, 2.8 billion uh, pounds and then uh, benefiting over 400 research projects. So you can see that um, uh, the, the number of projects uh, are spreading quite evenly across uh, the nine research councils. So, but of course, uh, if you look more closely, then uh, most of the research projects are mainly uh, in the science and engineer discipline because uh, the research uh, in these disciplines are more research intensive. But however, still, if you add up the number, so there are still around 700 research projects funded by HHRC and also ESRC in the discipline of arts and humanities and social science. And then also, uh, to look at the EU funding, so uh, it is also quite important for the universities in the UK because here, if you look at the figures from universities of UK, an association of basically all the universities in, in the UK, so around actually 15% uh, of the funding of universities actually uh, has come from the EU. And then also, as I have said, so uh, research income can also come from charities like the British Academy and also Wellcome Trust as well as the Liberty Trust. And then also it's possible to uh, carry out uh, contract research commissioned by uh, private companies. And then to take uh, my university as an example. So if you look at our financial statement in the academic year 2018, and also 19, you can see uh, we have derived our research income from different resources. So most of our money actually came from the government, UK and also from the EU. And then uh, as, again, a significant portion of money uh, came from the research councils and then less so, but still a substantial amount came from the charities that I have mentioned. Uh, a relatively smaller portion came from the industry and also uh, the companies. And then we should capital grants, I'm not quite sure what that means. But however, I uh, just would like to add my point, one more point about uh, funding from industry and uh, companies. So I can give you one example uh, from uh, the University of Leicester. So uh, Leicester is quite famous uh, for our research in space technology. So we have uh, our own space park. So it's in the process of being built, but however, we will soon have our own space park, Leicester Space Park. So um, we have one research center in Leicester Space Park. Uh, this research center is funded by a very large pool of money at the scale of uh, 600 million. So, but however, if you look at this 600 million, only a fraction of it actually came from the public. So around just 200 million came from the government with the rest coming from uh, the businesses, charities, and also some um, donors, some private donors. So uh, in the case of this research center uh, of our university, so for example, you can see co-investments from some very famous companies, including for example, Airbus, manufacturer of airplane, Lockheed Martin, the US so, uh, military uh, equipments, and then Tells Space, and then also some other companies. So you can see that uh, it is possible uh, to get funding uh, from the private sector to carry out research within the university, as you can see from this example in our Leicester Space Center and uh, Space Park. And then uh, to conclude my uh, presentation, so if you want to know more about uh, the landscape uh, of UK in relation to research, so I will encourage you to uh, have a look at the UKRI website because from the website, then you can find various strategic documents, for example, the UK government R&D roadmap, the UKRI strategy, as well as uh, their delivery plans. And then uh, also, as I say, because if, uh, for the broad ground, so um, the large chunk of money coming from the government, if you want to get a lot of money from this, then you have to make sure you do well in REF, in the research excellence framework. So if you want to know more about uh, our REF, then make sure you go to uh, the website there, the bottom one uh, on my slides here. 
So I think then that is pretty much uh, everything that I want to say. Then perhaps I will hang the scene uh, back to uh, Kalida. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Horace Young, for a very interesting and informative presentation. And now we would like to give the floor to Mr. Chagatai Telly from Turkey. Mr. Telly is a senior economist and planning expert. He had various roles in national and international administrations, including the World Bank, OECD, and UNDP in the past. His multidisciplinary background spans through a set of interrelated policy issues, including macroeconomics, development policy, science, and technology policy. Mr. Chagatai Telly, thank you very much for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me, Ms. Halila Azgilova? Yes, 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 please. Mm -hmm. We hear you well. Yeah, okay, thank you. Now, uh, thank you for this kind invitation. I'm trying to do my best from a countryside uh, in Ankara. So let me just try to just jump to my presentation. If I could happily. Can you see it now? Is that okay? Yes, we can see it. Keep going. Yeah, yeah thank you. Now, uh, I'm just gonna give a brief introduction to the story of Turkish science and technology policy in the last 15 to 20 years of time. Now, if you are talking about science and technology policy, we are dealing with some weak, weak problems here because uh, it's very, you know, uh, the problem is very complex. The structure is very complex. There are many, many different components, many different government institutions. So as a policy maker, as a policy designer, it is very natural that these kind of horizontal policies really take time and energy just to focus on and to map out all the interrelationships between different components of the same problem. So it's a big problem. It's a huge and complex ecosystem. So we should always keep in mind this complexity, both in design of the policy and in operations of programs, strategies, and action plans. It is very important to take a clear picture, clear idea of what we are going to do in the next five to 10 years of time. So I think this is very important. And it's a very indicative, exemplary policy domain that reflects all this complexity. I mean, it's a difficult job, but happily, of course, there are in, uh, high-performing countries that you can take some lessons, you can uh, take good cases, practices, but it's important that to uh, how to adapt all these models into one country's uniqueness is very important because there are multiple systems, not uh, commonalities, we have commonalities, but systems are not the same. Now, at the beginning of the story in 1990s, as you've seen here in the slide, gross expenditure on research and R&D in Turkey was very, very tiny. Still, it's not a big amount, maybe, but as, uh, as the country, so uh, both policymakers and politicians, I think all other governments try to, you know, increase this gross expenditure on research and R&D in total numbers. Of course, yes, you can see in 2016, but in 2018 and 19 number is just about 1% of GDP, which is, makes 8 billion USD total R&D expenditure in terms of Turkish GDP, which is a big amount. But still, we have a long way to go. We know all this, but there are some stories behind this. It is not just the level. It is just not the money. It is not just the number. 
So the structure is changing, the policy metrics is changing, and everything is changing. So what happened? So Turkish experience and Turkish mm, way to you know nudge to 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 just make some some policies uh, on a programmatic approach, just in many other countries. So we have some national programs, strategies and action plans. So there are, of course, different institutions taking part all in these studies, but uh, generally there is also a horizontal approach. So ministries and agencies and universities are taking part uh, all in design of these strategies and, and, and programs. But generally the overall framework is programmatic. It is not, it is not the, you know, uh, less affair approach as in most other instances and you can see there are multiple policy instruments and funding weights in terms of funding weights you can see you know from centers of excellence grant, grants to corporate tax reliefs on r d and innovation equity financing so there are multiple instruments now that that has been introduced with these policy programs and strategies so are being implemented with different institutions but you can see you know the majority is uh, i think coming from uh, grant programs so public money the funding programs and and tax breaks so tax expenditures these are i think important very specific and very central you know, policy programs. So I don't know if we have time to go on this in detail, but just to show a picture. So there should be in the in the policy framework, uh, you can just start some central program, some central instruments, but uh, it will take some 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 other instruments as time passes and as the maturity takes in. Uh, you know generally as ecosystem develops as you accomplish some tasks some policy goals then you you introduce some other instruments so because there is demand coming from you know universities or industry uh, and etc so you introduce another uh, program and you try to address as the pub public uh, agency as the pub government body to to just get in scope and focus in that program and uh, policy instrument so if you just look at the responsible organizations uh, in these post programs, generally the funding uh, of the research R&D and innovation programs, generally you see multiple of institutions are taking part of this in the central government. You know, uh, this is number of initiatives. So the biggest one is the largest one is of course the scientific and technological research council of turkey which is founded in 1960s and responsible for you know funding uh competitive r d programs so it is most funds are competitive here so there are other ministries individual ministries the the light one here the at the center minister of industry and uh, science and technology and other ministries you'll see so there are multiple of uh, organizations taking part in this funding activities in terms of initiatives uh, is it wrong yeah so then uh, so how how to start you know at the beginning of at the beginning of uh, your journey or from the policy side i mean so I think uh, in this story, the interesting thing is uh, in just in the beginning of 2000, year 2000, so when the research funding is not uh, so developed uh, and the ecosystem is relatively poorer or relatively uh, disconnected each other. So we just started in Turkey with pumping money, okay? So making available funds, uh, financing programs and putting all those together so efficiency outcomes and blah blah so the quality indicators these are not important so you have to you have to create some channels you have to create some some funding programs and then you have to put money so just 
And then after 2008 and 2009, the great recession, uh, great, uh, recession period uh, in the global economy. So during those times, I think uh, it, is, it has been more important, the quality indicators and the efficiency and commercialization of R&D. You know, these issues have been more important. And, and the focus was then, so how can we increase, you know, the funding of uh, corporate industries and corporate firms. So where can we just tap in? How can we enable uh, those companies that they invest in uh, research and R&D of, increase, uh, of an increasing amount of the profits? So we introduced uh, uh, tax breaks and uh, tax expenditures into the system. So I think it is it was very, very influential. And uh, just in the 2018 now, well, the largest amount of funding is coming from corporate sector rather than government bodies or universities. So 8 billion USD of total R&D funding, 4.8 billion is coming from, is uh, funded by corporate uh, bodies, firms and enter, enter, uh, entrepreneurs. So in the coming, uh, in the coming period, I think, uh, the Turkish research and R&D system is largely developed not now, but we are behind our targets as the nation. So in the coming period, 2020 and 2023, I think the some of the challenges will be resilience of funding. So how can we keep these funds go uh, in, in these catastrophic and chaotic times of world economy? So how can we secure those funding and, and more selective efforts so we can develop more selective efforts, so efficiency, uh, have become a con has become a concern and bilateral cooperation. So these are increasingly increasingly on the table now. And I think uh, starting from 2023 and 25, uh, uh, third third party funding will be more important. Venture capital just it started and commercialization of R&D, and uh, in many other uh, national vision studies you'll see. So we we want to be a science and technology power at least uh, to to increase our gross expenditure on research and development at uh, OECD level which is 2 uh, 2.2 uh, 2 or 2.3% i think so that is the that is the national vision at the moment so thanks for having me to the presentation Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Telly. Indeed, it was very interesting to learn more about the policies of Turkey in research management and science governance. And let me now pass the floor to our sixth speaker from this panel, Tamara Kravchenko. Dr. Tamara Kravchenko is an assistant professor at the University of Victoria, Canada. She has conducted comparative public policy research and territorial development in over a dozen countries and has authored over 50 articles books and ports. Dear Tamara, many thanks for being with us today and for finding time to join our discussion. The floor is yours. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going, can you hear me okay? I hope. I'm going to share my screen now. Yes. Um, I'm going to share this and go full. All right, so I hope that's showing up. So it's such a pleasure to join this conversation today. I'm gonna to talk today about the Canadian Public Research and Innovation Funding, uh, focusing on the public side. And I titled my presentation, Steering Not Rowing, because that's really the Canadian approach. It's to create some incentives to put funding out there to promote collaboration with the private sector, within academia, um, but also not to dictate. Uh, and I'm also going to reflect some of the Canadian experiences on uh, what, what innovation funding and, and scientific research funding could look like in Kyrgyzstan as, as uh, in Kazakhstan as Kazakhstan wraps up, uh, ramps up their funding. So just to look at where Canada stands in the OECD, Canadian overall R&D spending is a, you know, a bit below the OECD average if you look at it as a proportion of GDP, and these are 2008 figures. So here you see 
Um, OECD average is around 2% and Canada is a bit below that at around 1.5. And if we look at uh, the actual public spending, so just isolating only the public amounts of funds. Now I took this as a per capita figure, but you can see Canada is in around the middle of the pack, uh, standing between the United Kingdom and France for government budget allocations for R&D, and that's all government in-house and funding for uh, you know, university and, and, uh, and uh, institutes and colleges. So, what does Canada's public research and innovation funding look like? Um, public funding for university research, and I should add community colleges in there as well because they are important, it has increased in the last decade. In general, Canadian public funding aims to inform, fill this like important gap, but it doesn't want to crowd out private sector investment. And private sector investment is important in the Canadian funding environment. The vast majority of R&D funding in Canada is private. Um, after that, it's the funding that runs through the universities is the second largest number, and much of that is publicly funded. And finally, a much smaller amount is actually done in-house by government, and even much smaller um, is that of the nonprofit uh, sectors. In contrast to the United States, private funding is important in the university sector, but perhaps not anywhere near as important as it is in the US. So we're a little bit different that way. Um, I want to do in my presentation today to highlight two federal initiatives. So Canada is a federal state. We have the national government playing a really leading role in the funding of university led research and science and R&D. But provinces and territories also have ways and policy tools to encourage this. So where I live, for instance, in British Columbia, the province here has the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions. And uh, that's a big chunk of funding to try and promote solutions for climate change. But I'm just gonna talk today a bit about the federal initiatives, the national initiatives. So one of the first ones in recent years has been the creation of Canada Research Chairs. And this is a really great program to attract global talent. It invests to create research chairs in universities across Canada. Chairholders are, from big and small universities. And uh, what this creates is uh, really focused researchers who don't have a lot of teaching responsibilities, who can focus on mentorship, mentorship and, re and, and research. And I think what's important about this program is that it's global, it's trying to attract the top talent. It also precludes that innovation can come from anywhere. We're not choosing that these shareholders only go to the so-called top research universities or the research intensive universities. They're at universities across the country. The second initiative I'd point out in Canada is the creation of something called innovation super clusters. So while I just said that um, shareholders are spread out and that that's great, there is this idea of business-led innovation super clusters of which post-secondary institutions and government are partners. Innovation Canada is a federal um, initiative that was, it's like an agency that was set up to promote these innovation super clusters to try and really be strategic with certain high value invest in, investments and to co-invest with industry. And so this is a newer initiative in Canada. And I think it's one worth mentioning um, because it's really pushing for new forms of partnership. So to get back to this idea of steering, not rowing, we have national granting councils for both the social sciences and humanities, for health research, and for the national natural sciences and engineering. And if you're looking at post-secondary education funding for science and research, this is most of where that money is coming from alongside private sector funding. The research can be responsive. So these granting agencies have general calls and they can also put out special calls to rapidly address pressing challenges in Canadian society today. So we've had a lot of calls to deal with COVID. There have also been calls that are thinking of foresight, thinking about what our future challenges is. And, and these calls don't necessarily dictate what researchers should be working on, but they say, you know, in our analysis, in our foresight planning, these are some of the top challenges and these, these are things that should, should be focused on. And I think that's a, a flexible instrument that's really useful in making sure that the granting agencies are being responsive. 
A second trend of note is that when you're writing grants across the range of granting agencies, they increasingly ask researchers to demonstrate the importance and relevance to society of their work. And that is now then a criteria in the judgment. And part of what that has led to is interdisciplinary teams. So it's not enough for, for instance, um, work on renewable natural gas to proceed in a certain way. It's important that that work, that technology development actually is useful in places, in different places. And so what I'm seeing is that increasingly our granting councils are asking for interdisciplinary teams. And, and, and that's a bit of an innovation in recent years that they're looking to, you know, if you're going to have an, enge an engineering team working on technology development, you should bring on social scientists who understand the adoption of that technology and its meaning in society. Another effort I see of late is scaling up, um, creating nodes, clusters of expertise. These aren't necessarily geographic, but to create kind of very dynamic large projects that have a lot of different expertise. A lot of our granting agencies are structuring our research funds to encourage that. And the final one I'm seeing is special funds for innovative and risky research. This is filling a private sector gap. This is stuff that the private sector wouldn't necessarily fund and that the granting agencies are coming in to develop special funds to encourage that. And some of these grants are very, very large. And this is a quite new as well. Now I'd like to reflect on what this might mean, what Canadian, what Canada's approach might mean for the Kazakhstan's regional innovation system. And because there are some similarities between our two countries, Kazakhstan is large and it has low population density. It has an oil economy and it has a lot of rural regions. Economic diversification in those rural regions in particular is important. Canada is large, it has low population density, it has oil regions, economic diversification is important. Both of our countries have agriculture, value added is important. I, in 2017, worked on a study with the OECD, which was a territorial review of Kazakhstan. And in that study, we made a number of recommendations and we pointed out that, as you know, Kazakhstan is under investing in R&D. Um, investment has been relatively low and at that time it had stayed around the same level over the past decade. Innovation activities in Kazakhstan were modest even in the top performing regions in Western and Northern Kazakhstan, Zambul and uh, Kustanai, and only 22 national universities among 132 in total were involved in science and technology activities. And so this report really said, you know, policies should support a regional innovation system. They should focus on strengthening and developing new research infrastructure and enhancing industry and university linkages and increasing the mobility of researchers. And that's a culture shift and that's easy to say, but what does it look like in practice? And as for some summary reflections, as Kazakhstan moves to really um, increase their, their, their public funding for, for scientific research and development, I would, I would can think that they could consider a few things. The first is that innovation can look different in different, it can take different forms. It doesn't have to necessarily be conventional science and tech, particularly in rural in innovation looks different. And if you create criteria that are focused on conventional science and tech, you're gonna be missing out on a large part of your economy, which is important. And in Kazakhstan, that's the rural economy. So value added agricultural products, food products could be a really important part of economic diversification and innovation in Kazakhstan, if you design conventional science and tech funding, you're going to miss out on that potential. The second one is to encourage partnerships and scale up efforts through public and interdisciplinary partnerships. And that's another part of key program design. In Canada, we have a nonprofit called MyTax, which is a platform to connect public and private researchers. That might be something to look at um, that could create kind of nodes of expertise and those necessarily need not be geographic nodes. The second is to attract and grow talent. I think our, the Canada Research Chair Program is a good example of that and not just to the biggest cities. Um, that talent can be anywhere in the country. And the final one is to encourage, but don't row, don't lead, bold and socially relevant research. You can write that into um, how grants are actually structured to create those incentives alongside what we use in Canada 
tax incentives, regulatory incentives, and so on for R&D. Innovation takes a lot of different forms. If I think of Canadian innovations, Canadian innovations include IMAX films, they include uh, pacemakers and insulin, but they also include creating garbage bags, paint rollers, uh, everyday things. So taking a broad view uh, is, uh, is probably useful and I'll leave my remarks at that. Okay, thank you very much, Tamara. So um, I would ask uh, to all of our panelists uh, several questions. Uh, so our first question, we have, um, so as I understood, so each presenter uh, tell about a public-private partnership and understanding that private sector should invest to innovation should to create innovation. Uh, in this regards, so we have a question. So if you have an exact number of how much in numbers or in the percent of tax reduction, government policy provide for business if they invest to um, science, technology or innovation. So please. You're welcome to answer. Kenneth? <laughs> well, it's, it's a very good and simple question. The answer is unfortunately less uh, simple because it consists of uh, uh, deductions uh, for uh, salaries, for uh, uh, the, the social cost of a researcher is in, in industry is a bit lower than the ordinary social cost. So there is a deduction for um, uh, investing in um, st uh, hiring staff working with research. Uh, and there's also um, a way that uh, companies are allowed to use uh, R&D money as investment money and not as costs in their um, booking. So it means that they can deduce the cost over a long period of time, maybe up to, yeah, sometimes up to 10 years. And that that does i mean they have to pay for the cost of course but it means that they can uh, invest and and use uh, income during longer time to um, reduce the cost of research uh, so but there are no special uh, uh, tax deduction just uh, research per se so uh, uh, it's a combination there are a number of of uh, particularly taxation rules that uh, makes it cheaper to invest in research Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, Jako, can you add? Would you like to add something from your yes, perspective? I, I actually co covered it, uh, I, I think, in the presentation already that it's it's 100% uh, if, it um, if it is less than 250,000 euros per organization. So, But um, then, of course, there are some very large companies who want to invest a whole lot of more. How they usually do it is, is through a foundation. Uh, for example, Nokia, Nokia Foundation uh, distributed 4.4 billion euros in, in, in research last, last year. That's of course their own, own research, so they don't, pay, they don't pay tax from that. Okay, great, thank you. Tamara, would you like to add something? It's a similar in Canada, there's different tax thresholds uh, depending on the amount spent but over time. Okay, Lithuanian experience want us? <laughs> yes, so for example, if you imagine a company and it expenses X amount of money for some of the research process, which includes uh, like research innovation and other development, so then you can expect to have about three X, so three times more funding from the state. It's sort of competitive funding, so it's not guaranteed to be provided, but you need to apply for it. And also, as I mentioned before, if you just buy service from universities, it's possible to get also some part covered. It might be up to 50% or maybe less, depending on company size. Okay. For all expenses, yeah. Thank you. Forrest? Would you like to add? You can. Uh, just want to say, other than a lawyer, I'm also an accountant. 
So I think that would depend on what kinds of test benefits that you are talking about. Because as already flagged up by Professor Pearson already, so if you treat the expenses, them as treat out at the exact expenses as expenses, then that should be readily test deductible. And then also, but even if you treat as a capital investment, so you can still amortize it uh, over the years. So again, it will be test deductible. So I think that would depend on what types of tax benefits that you are talking about. Okay, thank you. So we have uh, uh, some question from UK, Natalia Redko. She asked that the low level of innovation coming from corporate R&D in developing countries like Kazakhstan is not because of the lack of funding and poor management, but maybe because of the lack of proactive behavior of big companies to create innovation. So, and uh, she asked the panelists, what do you think can be done to stimulate big companies to develop R&D in catching up economies? Should government develop a stricter policy that boosted corporate innovation or focus more on creating new markets or something else? Some comments on this uh, issue? Well, maybe I can say one comment. Uh, in our university, Kaunas University of Technology, we have separate like department. It's called National Innovation Center, and it's responsible to get connections from outside, either for projects or some other common activities. So maybe having such centers in your in university also can help, just to keep that connection because scientists themselves often do not know how to present them. They are good at research, but they, they do not know how to advertise themselves. And company also needs something. Well, they then can just create a new department and work on it, but also they can find somebody from the outside. So such kind of center, maybe not necessary at the university, mm -hmm. might be a type of agency or something else might be helpful. Mm -hmm. So, another comment? I, I could offer a remark, is that it, it is a culture shift. And uh, as part of the culture shift, you so? it's an institutional shift for universities as well in terms of how they work with the private sector. So in a lot of um, countries that I've studied where there, there isn't a strong connection between the private sector and university-led research, it's in part because of how the university or the tertiary sector is set up, that they don't have uh, a way to facilitate those connections and that their programs themselves are not necessarily responsive to private sector need. So that there's something to be said of institutional organization within the university environment to be more connected to uh, private sector innovation and development. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So colleagues, as we understand the uh, competencies of the researcher is uh, one of the important thing. So we have a, a question from Jules Dovletpaeva. Uh, she asked, uh, how do scientists in your countries prove their competencies as a researcher? Publication activities, results, grants, and etc. to apply for such grants uh, and uh, be uh, uh, qualified for this grant. So do you have uh, some indicators for researchers in your country? Yeah. Okay, so if I, if I may, uh, in Lithuania, we will almost always, if you apply for bigger projects, look if you have publications in top-ranked journals, which means quartile one and two, quartile three is not so important. Also, about the projects, so we tend to evaluate international and national projects and almost always do not pay attention to institutional uh, projects. Also, from the government, we have, from the Science Council, we have a list of publishers which are not recommended, which are treated as predatory journals and so on. So we should need to have that list. So taking everything into account, which is just top journals and not into some predatory list. Okay, Kenneth, would you like to add something? 
it's roughly the same uh, in uh, Sweden. Also, the funds are important. So showing uh, that you have a historic good records of uh, getting grants is important. Uh, that uh, and but that is of course connected to that. If you have grants, you can produce more uh, uh, fine papers. So um, I mean, it, it's uh, it's a a good uh, positive circle if you get into it. Uh, and um, uh, one way is also to uh, uh, one one thing that has been highlighted the last years is to see how much have been done in terms of innovation and industrial contacts, and that has been regarded in. A, addition to the number of published papers that has been regarded as an important sign of uh, high quality research. But mm. it varies a little bit with uh, different uh, areas, of course. So uh, engineering is easier to have industrial contacts than, let's say, uh, pure science. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, colleagues who would like to add something? Uh, Tamara, please. I could just add uh, a kind of similar to um, all of you know, the other countries discussed. However, there is some greater emphasis now on expressing the quality of mentorship and training for students. And there are also, so that there isn't a bias always towards incumbents in research programs, there are special funds or a portion of funds that are set aside for emerging scholars. And I think that's um, something worth looking at. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jaco, please. Yes, uh, this all sounds very similar. Uh, one thing I would like to point out is, is that, um, for example, in case of Finland, and I think in, in many other countries, a lot of the research is done in the companies. So, for example, two thirds of our R&D is, is done in the companies and it al always doesn't uh, um, show up as a research paper. So it can also show up as innovations and, uh, and new products and uh, so, so this is also one, one thing to, to point out, the cooperation with, with industry, how, how has that worked out and what, has, what have been the results of it? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, uh, colleagues, who would like to add some comments? If not, uh, so I want to say thank you very much for your participation. So it was uh, a great presentation and uh, of course for 10-20 minutes it's impossible to cover everything. But I hope we will have uh, this uh, deep cooperation and we'll invite you to join our another uh, sessions. So thank you, thank you very much. And now we would like to move to our another uh, panel session. Uh, its view of a Kazakh researcher who are working in different country and know the Kazakh reality to uh, um, give us some recommendation or overview of uh, uh, two sides of uh, research development and uh, um, point out of some specific uh, conclusion which we are discussed in previous uh, uh, sessions. Uh, and uh, in this regard, uh, let me uh, give the floor to researcher in water resource engineering of Lund University, uh, Sweden, Kamshat Tusupova. Please, Kamshat, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, Bojan, thank you very much. Um, First of all, it was really, we have been here for almost more than three hours. There have been so many sessions and several examples of the countries, how they develop the science, interaction between the science development, uh, government uh, and industry, how we call business, society. Uh, please, if you would like to put my, if you could put my presentation. As far as I see, our part is discussion part. Um, um, and uh, I would mostly like to summarize certain points what have been discussed so far. Um, quite a lot. Um, sorry, my, I have a different presentation. So now our colleagues will share your presentation. You can keep talking, please. Okay. So uh, I would basically like to have some summary. Uh, how I usually say, there's a lot of interesting examples, sort of benchmarking, how the other countries developed the science, uh, what investments they did. Uh, though I believe that there are basic 
uh, elements to develop designs, basic principles and of interaction. And I would like to point out maybe the major basic elements, how designs, um, well, what are the efforts that government put to develop designs? Um, sorry, what about the presentation? Um, uh, you can can keep to, uh, talking. I think without presentation, so uh, uh, we will share this presentation. Okay. So the first thing that I would like to point out is that uh, what is the aim of science? Uh, science uh, helps us to understand the world, which is basically fundamental sciences or the outcome of, of fundamental sciences, such as gravity or some calculation of water in space, uh, the structure of DNA. And then I would say the second aim of the science is uh, to improve the quality of life. And that is usually we talk about applied sciences or the outcome of applied sciences that could be seen in terms of goods or services, both intellectual or like services as such. Um, yeah, uh, so in these terms, I think it's really important to um, uh, emphasize that usually the outcome of applied sciences quite often find the space in uh, within industry. Um, as an uh, well, as an example, uh, in Sweden, uh, as Kenneth mentioned before, and actually in quite several examples that have been presented today, uh, more than half of the innovations are funded by the industry or business. Um, that is for the first topic. Um, the second point that I would like to point out is we call it triple helix. It's the integration of science, government, and industry. And maybe it's more of a discussion whether we should put it industry or business or society as such. Uh, maybe we could have or a little bit of discussion on that. Uh, when we talk about this triple helix, I think it's very important that uh, the role of government is to assure the, the competency of the scientists. Uh, we talk about when we talk about Sweden or other countries. Um, con government is really interested in integration, science, and business, but you cannot make it very easily. There should be some assurance. So, uh, let's say in Sweden, the government assures the quality of the scientists. Now, there was a question. I mean, when I say quality, it's more of a in a bracket quality. Um, there was a question related to that about competency of the researchers, and obviously, you cannot basically force the government to work with the scientists unless you should the quality of the outcome. Uh, also, the point is, we believe, or I believe, that industry is a natural way of law for innovation. But here, uh, one might discuss or argue that when we talk industry, maybe I'm a little bit more narrow talking about business industry. However, I think uh, if we look at this Swedish example, it, we could talk broadly about society as there were several other examples, like in Sweden, there is Wallenberg Foundation, and that foundation is the money from different uh, companies, big companies like AstraZeneca, for example, ABS, and so on. Uh, obviously, there is certain, um, um, it's difficult to say whether it's a, a proper construction. However, um, these companies, they invest innovation, and mostly obviously related to their own um, industry, Field. Uh, the third point, well, maybe further on we could discuss about competencies of the scientists. There was a question about it and the previous panel speakers talked about it, the competency. Usually we talk about um, research publications. I think it's it's very important to specify when we talk about competence, about end product. Uh, if we talk about um, the function of re researchers is basically to to do inventions or to have certain new products, new knowledge. Uh, it's difficult to say that the outcome of research is implemented product. That is actually the maybe function of the industry. So and the researchers obviously should have the competencies that could be expressed in the published papers. Someone talked about uh, patents and so on, but that I think we should really make a, a bit of segregation because we have researchers that work at the universities and quite often when you apply for public or governmental funding uh, to have publications, it's one of the important criteria. Uh, 
But when, once when we talk about uh, innovation at the industry, and usually let's like examples of Scandinavian countries, when usually industries have RD within their industry, within their um, company, and that is usually the outcome is not really published paper, but some product. So I think there should be uh, differences. And then we should know when we apply for funding. If you apply for industrial, it's something one thing. But if you apply to governmental funding, that's a little bit of different, might be different requirement. So the third point is, um, at least in Sweden, and we believe that it should work in all the other countries, decisions are should be science-based at all the levels of governance. Uh, for example, uh, let's say again, it's example from Sweden. Uh, when we talk about different um, governmental decisions on a high level, government level or local municipality level, they usually should have certain scientific approach or it should get sort of approval from the scientist or scientists should be involved uh, into this process. Uh, maybe clear, one of the um, clear examples is COVID situation in Sweden. Uh, if we come back to Agency for Public Health and Wellbeing in Sweden, uh, the uh, epidemiology unit has almost all the workers there have PhD, uh, quite well-established researchers, and they basically develop different scenarios, how COVID can be in Sweden, what measures to have, like keeping the distance, whether wearing to mask, what is the proof for that, if we wear the mask, to what extent, and so on. And those um, the decisions that were made by the government, they mostly were based on the uh, outcome of the, um, I would say, uh, scientific research or the offers, what scientists offered. So it's one of the high level the, the, um, examples, the, the decision that made on the high level. When it comes to the local, for example, Kenneth uh, also works at uh, Sudvatten. It's a uh, water research, uh, sorry, water supply organization. And within that organization, they have RD. And Kenneth is the one who is linked to the university, also head of that RD. And quite often, usually they say the decisions are made after basically RD approval. So uh, uh, there was interesting presentation of Tamara uh, that she talked about uh, freedom of research. Uh, and she also gave different indicators, although uh, personally, I think indicators are uh, quite often, well, you can see that not often that the um, amount of money that you invest could be counted in terms of publishable papers and so on. There are countries that invest quite a lot in research, although there is uh, less number of publications per invested unit of money. But I think it's, the, uh, it's not only number of papers, but it's the quality of the research uh, that should be pointed out. So whenever we talk about the country and uh, research development, I think three things that are very important to remember or highlight is first is the competency of the scientist. Um, Basically, government assures that our scientists, they are competent enough to conduct the research, both the fundamental applied. The second, it should be governmental engagement. I don't think there is any country, any country where without governmental uh, involvement, somehow scientists could find the common language with the business or vice versa, business with, uh, with the scientists. Although it's not only that they put together the science and the business, but it's also different uh, governmental rules to that basically encourages business have innovations or yeah, innovations. Uh, for example, in Sweden, one example when it comes to Sweden, it's environmental law. I think environmental law really pushes the uh, the industry or the business to think environmentally, and that obviously um, um, encourages them to work with scientists. And the uh, third point is freedom of research. Um, now we heard a lot about different funds and when we come again back to Sweden, maybe I give more examples about Sweden. We have different types of uh, funding agencies. One is governmental and usually government, they fund both fundamental and applied science, sciences. And here we see quite a lot of freedom of research. So uh, basically researchers can offer their ideas and they, if they find if they are found to be interesting and obviously they fund it. The other level of funding is uh, different foundations, like for example, the Wallenberg Foundation, where different organizations 
from industry merged and created the foundation. And that might have, to some extent, freedom of research for researchers, but at the same time, to some limited. Uh, for example, one of the uh, co-founders of this foundation is AstraZeneca, and obviously quite a lot of research is given to medical field. Um, then uh, the third, well, I would say the third part of the uh, research is uh, smaller innovation products, but they're quite often also limited to the company's um, res uh, um, industry or their field. So uh, in these terms, I would say that freedom of research is quite important, and it's quite often it's guaranteed mostly on the governmental level funding. Well, uh, basically, I'm done. Uh, maybe if you have some questions. Uh, Sweden uh, is, uh, I think it's one of the top countries in terms of innovation, and particularly Lund University, we have developed ultrasound, uh, artificial kidney, and Bluetooth, for example, and so on. And actually, Bluetooth is a very good example when industry invested. Uh, uh, and that was developed by research engineers at the industry. Uh, well, which I think is also shows the uh, connection between industry and scientists. Yeah. Well, thank you. Questions? Dear Kamshas, thank you very much for your uh, remarks about uh, the today's discussion. It was uh, quite valuable for us uh, to receive them. And now I would like to give the floor to our final uh, discussant uh, with the concluding presentation of the today's event. This is Dr. Chokan Laumulin. Dr. Chukan Laumulin is a research affiliate at Jesus College, University of Cambridge. His research and development studies is dedicated to organization and development of science in connection with industry, society and modernization. He has more than 25 years of global professional experience in academia, education, media and some entrepreneurial activities. Dr. Chukan Laumulin, thank you very much for being with us today. The floor is yours. Oh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, what about my presentation? Can you see it before I begin? What's that? What's that? What's that? Can you see it? Can you hear me? Can you see the presentation? Hello? Yes, yes, we can see it and hear you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, great, great. Good. Uh, hello again. Um, first of all, let me thank you both uh, the organizers for this excellent opportunity to speak on such an important developmental topic as uh, science policy is, and the, to the previous distinguished speakers, especially to Professor Young for shedding light on the UK science and innovation, current science and innovation policy, and to Professor uh, to Supova who shed light on, on, on the topic of the triple helix innovation uh, model. And I'm going to speak about this um, as well. And uh, as Professor Tusupov said, before I begin, I would like to uh, emphasize that in economic and business literature, very often uh, there is a confusion around the term uh, research and development, IMB, as the um, science and technology are very often combined there. And research implies both um, basic and industrial research. And then I would like to, to draw your attention that science is a proposition of knowledge, which is knowing of what, whereas technology is, is a prescriptive knowledge, prescriptive knowledge which uh, requires certain uh, prescriptive action to um, manipulate uh, knowledge for creating um, goods. And actually, an increasing the set of, of prescriptive knowledge creates um, is um, it um, allows society to create cheaper and better products and, or goods, which is, uh, lies at the heart of the economic uh, growth process, independently on the country's uh, political, ideological, or ethnical constituency. So, what is the University of Cambridge? Um, it's, um, as, um, as was mentioned before, um, our university is more than 800 years old. And it includes very notable alumni who contributed greatly to the progress of mankind. 
it's a, like Newton and it's a practical establishment of, of physics of no nature of philosophy they call it and then be, and before the 20th century all the physics called Newton's physics it's um Francesco Vigani uh he's a John Francis as well is the first professor of chemistry and, and contemporary of New, Newton's contemporary it's a Charles Darwin uh without who it would be impossible to 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 have most of the biotechnology or development of biology today it's as, as well Thompson, Rutherford, Capita, Watson, and so on. Thompson, it's um, his discovery, I should mention it in relation to my talk, it's um, his discovery of electron in 1897 in Cambridge, um, uh, practically allowed all high-tech industry of today we have. And the Rutherford is the structure of atom. Uh, Capita is the school of Rutherford as well as Abraham Yorfes, he's both Soviet and, and Cambridge scientist. And it's uh, he contributed a lot to to what it's called now quantum physics, and it's a physics of temperature. Watson Creek and jo and and Watson and Creek, it's a discovery of DNA. Overall, Cambridge has um, 107 Nobel laureates, and the Cavendish Lab, which is the department of physics, in includes 40, 40 of them. Venture capital of um, of of the University of Cambridge, it's, it exceeds 56 and a half billion US dollars. And the main principle I would dis describe that human capital development is put is put as the main approach and, it, and, and, and which is seen as the foundation of economic diversification and sustain sustainability, not only of the UK, but in the global time. But before uh, Cambridge achieves um, this um, amazing result and, and in what, what became possible to, to perform such a contribution, it's, it, it happened due to accumulation of knowledge uh, which would happen through millennia. And uh, it's led to um, one principle, which is put in the, in the heart of teaching process in both um, Oxford and Cambridge. And at Oxford, this principle is, is based on the face-to-face -face education. As you highly doubt, possibly know as an Oxford graduate, mm, that mm, our teaching process is, is based that, that we, we spend our um, in mornings in our department and later on uh, in usually in the afternoons we go to our colleges uh, where we and we will learn from our master from our teachers face to face however this principle wasn't um, invented in Cambridge in, according to Sergei Kapitsa uh, Pyotr Kapitsa's son who was pretty known in the Soviet Union um, as well this principle was brought from the madaris of Bukhara and Samarkand uh, by Venetian monks in the foundation of Oxford and, and slightly later Cambridge. And uh, basically those um, 300 madaris of uh, Bukhara and Samarkand represented those modern lab of that, of that time uh, where mathematics and science and, and philosophy uh, were, were researched. Um, I should mention in relation to our technology and to illustrate how all this accumulation of the knowledge leads to our technology and innovation today. In the 19th century, um, a duke from Bukhara, Bodbon near Bukhara, Al Khwarezmi, uh, set up the principles of algorithm and algebra, which are both named after him today, and uh, while using computer and, and doing this talk. We, we actually um, should thank Al Harizmi as well. Um, later on, for instance, continuing this, um, um, continuing this um, ideas of uh, how computer industry was developing, for instance. So the proto language, or com the proto computer language, is a Newton Leibniz calculus, and uh, both Newton and Leibniz are contemporaries and actually describe the same. Um, and the same phenomena in the in different ways and today we're using the, those ideas and all the titans of the um, uh, age of enlightenment contributed a lot to the establishment of modern philosophy the principle and an organization which is still modern science is built up on, on these principles and not, not only uh, natural sciences but it also contributed to law to expertise to social science scientists and uh, Leibniz ideas um, affected the development of, of Russia and later on the Soviet Union, because Leibniz in his conversation with Peter the Great, which was uh, numbered sixth 
and one of them lasted almost a week. And, and his, his correspondence with the uh, establi of Russian establishment of that time, he, um, in his letter to um, Count Gorshkov, he described that um, envisaged the development of science in Eurasia and its three-stage education across Russia to Persia and China to establish the, an Eurasian uh, power as a, as a global power. And, and um, even Leibniz mentioned that those that country which in which development of science and art will, will reach the best will be um, much nicer to me than my own Germany. Mm. Sorry, next slide. Um, so I would like to emphasize the, the unity and universalism of science, which is shared by all, um, all, all the scientists and most of the engineers beyond any borders, any frontier, or at any time, any even time. So Abram Yofe, they mentioned he's the father of uh, Soviet school of physics, for instance. His two citation, all form of industry are nothing but via section of physics or chemistry applied and exploited on a large scale. Today we can add biology to this short list. In, in, and then, physics is the foundation of technical progress. Physics is the reservoir from which new technical ideas and new technologies are drawn. At a given stage of development, research in physics transmitted to important technical achievement. In response to this um, article by Joffe, Nathaniel Frank, who was the head of physics department at MIT, uh, wrote the following. Physics is the one of the greatest intellectual achievements of mankind, and the impact of growth of science on social and political ideas has been such that a proper understanding of our present-day culture and problem is difficult to attain without an adequate scientific background. In the first section, um, uh, the first speaker mentioned Vannevar Bush, an architect of, of a modern American technological rise, and actually a uh, founder of NASA, uh, MIT in the present form and the um, Manhattan Project, uh, who contributed a lot to this. And if you look at, um, you would be amazed if you compare his his uh, his uh, report to, to his political leadership to Pyotr Kapitza's letters to Kremlin. You would be amazed at how uh, how the, both scientists and engineers were speaking is about the same thing, almost in very identical. Um, expressions. So Piotr Kapitza is really advanced science by studying the laws governing the natural world around us. We'll search for and create fundamentally new avenues for the material and spiritual development of society. Vanilla Bush, basic research leads to new knowledge. It provides scientific capital. It creates a fund from which the practical application of knowledge must be drawn. New products and new processes do not appear full grown. They are founded on new principles and new conception, which in turn are painstakingly developed by research in the purest realms of science. Today, it's truer than ever that basic research is a pacemaker of technological progress. A nation which depends on others for its new basic scientific knowledge will be slow in its industrial progress and weaken its competitive position in world trade, regardless of its mechanical skill. I believe it's, it's still very, very relevant for, for, for instance, for designing, for designing um, a science policy and science and innovation policy in Kazakhstan. And I believe that all was developed on, on, on this model of development, which we um, launched all together with my colleague, uh, Professor Sitka Saksena of uh, Quantum Meta Group, uh, Cavendish Lab. So the most important thing is an ecosystem. It's a social and education development. And here we put an education, of course, and politicization of of, uh, of educational process, uh, which leads to uh, science and culture, which always go hand in hand together. So science, which is driven purely by curiosity, by scientists' curiosity to grasp principles of nature and culture, which is a distinct form of human intellectual activity. They all lead to engineering, application of science, it's the seven levels of engineering, and it's important to, to delineate them, because when we talked today, before, we almost meant that, that uh, almost talk about, and often talk about industrial research, and in fact, um, corporation uh, in the vast majority of the cases don't do 
fundamental research, basic research, is always, is always done at research institution or universities. All this together lead to technology and innovation, which make an engineering useful for public good and or commercial gain, which constitute industry, economy, and, and, and in the end, finance. Breaking this um, linear sequence it is, is, is fraught with not achieving, achieving the goal. We, while thinking about finance and so receiving <laughs> benefits, we should, we should think of organizing all this all together. Um, often in today, for instance, in the UK, you can see when, when all um, some levels can mix up in, in one team. So one team can do uh, ev all, all things from science, so basic research and uh, to innovation, which is creating uh, product. I can give you an example of Camco uh, Limited at a at Cambridge startup, which is, a, um, is based on basic research and discovery of the spin-off leading to a new principle of uh, refrigeration and to creating uh, concrete products for market products. Uh, uh, overall, um, as the Professor Tsupova mentioned, it's a triple helix innovation model. So if you look at model three, which is on your right, uh, you will see that this is ideal model. When this is centers of this helix, um, they create an innovation core which rotates uh, and makes the whole system move and develop and actually provide the development. So it's the three centers of academia, state and industry. However, this model is really, really rare. And it's uh, you can see it in some not really big countries like Switzerland or Singapore. In most of the um, Anglo-Saxon countries, including US, uh, UK and um, Western European countries, you can see the model too in which uh, three centers of state, academia, and industry had been de developing for centuries. And industrial policy in these countries aim, is aiming at, at, uh, at cohering at uh, these centers, making them closer uh, together. Model one, it's a statist model. It, it's actually the USSR, or partially in many ways, it's China. Um, Excuse me, unfortunately, we have to wrap up. Could you please wrap up your presentation in one minute? So, as we Professor have... Young described, here is the, um, uh, how it works in the UK quite recently. So, we have UK Research and Innovation Body, which was established uh, by the Research Act of 2017 and was launched in April 2018, pretty recently. I believe it happened in response to a dramatic decline in innovation, which happened, in, which has been happening since um, 2016, and it's a, was designed to to to, to tackle um, Brexit, to tackle uh, the cl climate change, and and also now it's it's uh, to to react to the pandemic uh, challenges. And, um, and if you see, in order to, to to tackle this, in order to create this movement, as um, we can see the centralization of our research effort, coordination of central, uh, centralization of the coordination of the effort to create a, a united science policy to meet the ambitious goal of uh, to, um, uh, to reach the level of expenditures for IND of 2.4 percent um, by 2027. Currently, uh, UK spends uh, around. 1.7 percent of its GDP for research and development, from which possibly from 20 to 30 percent uh, goes for basic research, and it's um as you can see, it's 37 billion dollars, and uh, U UK research and innovation have a budget of 7.5 billion uh, pounds. So here is the all these bodies, which were described by Professor Young before, and I can see that they're all now combined for creating for creating a, a, um, a united vehicle. Ah, and I should mention that the, the important role, an organizing role of the Royal Society, which is uh, actually uh, called the Royal Society of London for Improving Natural Knowledge. And it's an, the oldest national academy of scientists in the world. And it's a very important body, which, which uh, the main um, purpose is coordinate uh, scientific efforts in the country 
and to keep the prestige of, of science in the society and worldwide. So, um, university have been the central place for industrial innovation. The first spin-off company was in Cambridge, was actually 1881 by Horace Darwin, youngest son of Charles Darwin. And Cambridge Silicon Fan, as we call it in Cambridge, or Cambridge Cluster, the Cambridge Cluster, is a vibrant ecosystem of high-tech businesses. It's focused on upon software and biotechnology, with around 1,500 companies in the region employing over 50,000 people around the area. It is home to many household names such as I am, Arcon Computing, and all the others you can you can see in the list. Um, actually, if you go to Cambridge, you can see all these companies having their uh, industrial research. Uh, divisions around university. It's not like university around the corporation, but co for corporation on every day, on daily basis, they need expertise, knowledge, and 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 actually supply of um, competent uh, specialists uh, from the university. Then they're all creating this triple helix uh, innovation model. Um, uh, what I should add that, that all these high tech companies in Cambridge they generate uh, three billion dollars annually in revenue. Uh, hello, Mulin. Sorry to interrupt you. Unfortunately, yeah. we are very short of time. Uh, we very much appreciate your presentation. And what I would like to suggest, uh, we will share your presentation with our, our audience and uh, and other mm -hmm. speakers and participants who are interested. We have been here for almost four hours. And uh, dear uh, dear role, let me now uh, conclude on our today's Jeff. discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we have come to the end of our second expert discussion on global practices in science governance and research management. The event was organized within the framework of the Kazakhstani governmental program Yale Umite, the change management training program for industry managers for institutional reforms and the nation's 100 step plan. And let me share with you the main points from today's discussion. Uh, today we've learned that uh, the most successful models of uh, science governance and research management globally have several important elements. First, uh, they are based on successful partnership um, and intensive partnership between the private sector and the government. Second, the government creates all the necessary conditions uh, for the development of research and science, including uh, the tax preferences for businesses that invest in the research. Thirdly, uh, each government has its own vision, strategy, um, a short-term, a long-term strategy on science development. And finally, all decisions, both on the central level and local level, always have a science justification. They are science-based. So, uh, dear, dear Ro, we cordially thank all our distinguished speakers today for their informative and valuable presentations. All discussed global practices will be analyzed by us in preparation of recommendations for our government on science governance in Kazakhstan. We also thank our audience for being with us today and the host of today's event, the Yale Basri Academy. You're welcome to follow the development of our project via the official page of Yale Umite on Facebook. Let me wish all the best to all of you. Take care and goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.